afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 11048 in the name of Michael Matheson on the Food Scotland Bill. I'd invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Minister Michael Matheson to speak to and move the motion. Minister, 14 minutes or thereby. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to open the debate on the general principles of the Food Scotland Bill. I'd like to thank those who gave the evidence, both written and in person, as well as the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, Finance and the Health and Sport Committee for their detailed scrutiny of the Bill at Stage 1. In particular, I welcome the latter's support for the general principles of the Bill and have recently responded to their Stage 1 report. Officer, the Scottish Government is committed to ensuring people in Scotland live longer, healthier lives. Making sure we eat a good, nutritious diet of safe food is vital to achieving that ambition. Foodborne diseases cost Scotland £140 million per year. More significantly, of the 130,000 consumers contracting foodborne diseases each year, around 2,000 will be hospitalised and around 50 will die. Bad eating habits are one of the most significant causes of ill health in Scotland and a major factor in obesity. Scotland is positioned near the top of the league tables for obesity amongst OECD countries. The public cost of dealing with obesity could rise to £3 billion per year by 2030. So even relatively minor improvements to the safety and standards of food in Scotland will have significant social and economic benefits. The Food Scotland Bill will give Scotland some of the levers we can use to tackle these issues. First, the Bill creates Food Standard Scotland to be Scotland's independent food safety and standards body. We are currently working to appoint a board and chair of high, high calibre uh, with the range of exp experience and skills required to guide Food Standards Scotland. We are also in the process of recruiting its first chief executive. Subject to the progress of the bill, we aim to have the chair identified early this month with the remainder of the board appointed to a shadow body by the end of November. We hope to have identified the Chief Executive by the end of this month also. As Food Standards Scotland will be a non-ministerial body operating free from the influence of ministers, the Board and Chief Executive will need sufficient space to prepare and develop their strategic thinking and build key relationships with partners in time for the FSS being up and running in April 2015. Food Standards Scotland's clear objectives, as set out by Ministers and Parliament in the Bill, will be to develop and help others develop policies on food and animal feedstuffs, advise the Scottish Government, other authorities and the public on food and animal feedstuffs, to keep the public and users of animal feeding stuffs advised, to help them make informed decisions about food and animal feedstuffs, and monitor the performance of enforcement authorities in enforcing food legislation. The Bill sets out specific duties and associated powers for the new body on acquiring and reviewing information through, carrying out observations and inspections, monitoring developments, and carrying out and commissioning and coordinating research. The Bill also allows the body to set performance standards for enforcement authorities mainly of local authorities, in enforcement of food legislation in Scotland. Once the Bill establishes the body, we will constitute it separately, by order, as a non-ministerial office in the Scottish Administration. As such, Food Standards Scotland will be fully accountable to the Scottish Parliament and autonomous from the Scottish Government. Food Standards Scotland will take on all the functions currently exercised in Scotland by the Scottish Division of the UK-wide Food Standards Agency. The remit of the Scottish Division 
has for some years been wider than the remit south of the border. However, in 2010, the UK Government removed responsibility for labelling and for nutrition policy from the English arm of the Food Standards Agency. In Scotland, we maintained the link between those and food safety. The UK decision was subsequently seen as having been a factor that hindered the UK Government's response to the horsemeat scandal in 2013. The horsemeat scandal demonstrated the importance of having a single body with clear responsibility for all aspects of food safety and standards. Indeed, it was the UK Government's decision that led us to review the work of the FSA in Scotland. And in March 2012, Professor Jim Scudamore, a former UK Chief Vet, published his report on the issue. His review concluded that food safety should not be divorced from nutrition and labelling and that advice on these subjects should be independent, evidence-based and consumer-focused. Advice on food safety and nutrition should come from a body at arm's length from Scottish ministers. Stuart Stevenson. Mr Stevenson. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister. I, I'm sure the Minister is very well aware of the long uh, series of contributions uh, Harry Burns, the former Chief Medical Officer, uh, has made in relation to the nurturing of our very youngest people in our society. Will the FSS pay particular attention in looking at nutrition uh, to helping ensure that uh, our youngsters, particularly in deprived areas, get the best possible start in life from the best possible food? Minister. I think one of the important elements that we can achieve through the creation of the FSS is the ability to have a body which can coordinate how we tackle issues around nutrition and changing people's diets to leading a more healthy diet and lifestyle in a way that we don't achieve at the present time because of the work that's undertaken by a range of different agencies. So the very issue that uh, Stuart Stevenson has highlighted is one of the areas that the uh, Food Standards Scotland will be able to take forward in a much more coordinated fashion than we are at the present time. But given the uh, report that we received from uh, Professor Jim Scudamore, uh, we took forward his key recommendation, uh, which was for the establishment of a specific food safety body here in Scotland, which has led to uh, legislation today to create, the food to create Food Standards Scotland. The bill also introduces new food law provisions. These are designed to protect and improve public health and other interests of consumers by driving up hygiene standards and reducing the incidence of foodborne disease, providing safeguards against food standards incidents, such as uh, the horsemeat food fraud, and strengthening and simplifying the pen penalties regime for breaches of food law. These arrangements will increase consumer and investor, conf investor confidence and will help make Scotland an even more attractive place for food businesses. The bill uh, provides for powers to seize and detain food which does not comply with food information law. These powers will more closely align food information powers with existing food safety powers. Currently, if food is unsafe, it can be seized or detained. Where food is unsafe, courts must order its destruction of the food itself. However, there is no such powers for food which is safe but does not comply with food information requirements. In light of the horsemeat food fraud incident, the power to seize or detain food that does not meet food information requirements in respect of labelling, for example, will help to eliminate food fraud. Without such a power being available at the moment, a food business may still be able to pass on food which does not comply with food information law. The bill also provides for the creation of a statutory offence of the failure to report breaches of food information law. Again, this will more closely align food standards requirements with the existing duty to report breaches of food safety legislation. Under the suggested arrangements, it would become an offence 
to fail to notify Food Standards Scotland if any food business suspects that food placed on the market does not comply with food information law. The bill also provides for a statutory scheme to, in, to be introduced at some point in the future by regulation for the mandatory display by food businesses of hygiene inspection outcomes. This is intended to drive up food hygiene standards and reduce the instance of foodborne disease. A voluntary scheme, uh, the Food Hygiene Information Scheme, is already in place and almost all of the local authorities in Scotland have launched it locally. A similar scheme has already been introduced in Wales and is being introduced in Northern Ireland. We will be monitoring uh, developments with this particular scheme with a view to considering the creation of a statutory scheme here in Scotland. For this reason, the new food law provisions in the bill gives ministers the powers to introduce a statutory scheme after fuller consultation. The bill also includes provision for Scottish ministers to regulate animal feeding stuffs and their production, retaining the existing powers which ministers have in the UK-wide Food Standards Act 1990. This is included as a delegated power for ministers to use where existing delegated powers may not be sufficient. Since 1999, the power has not been used in the UK, but we believe it should be retained to give us absolute assurance we have everything possible in place to guard against sufficient feed, uh, feeds uh, instance in the future. The bill also it streamlines Scotland's food law enforcement regime by offering administrative sanctions so that those who make or commit offences will be dealt with much more quickly and at less of a cost. This administrative sanction regime, comprising of a compliance notice and a fixed penalty, will give enforcement officers more flexibility to deal appropriately with food offences. The use of administrative penalties as an option will reduce the burden on the courts and reduce the cost of local authorities in respect of prosecuting through the court system. They will give enforcement authorities a wider, more proportionate set of tools to choose from when dealing with contraventions against food law. In evidence presiding officer to the Health and Sport Committee, it was suggested that there should be an appeal process for fixed penalty notices. We are considering this proposal and working closely with stakeholders to develop a transparent and consistent process for resolving any disputes. These enforcement and improvement arrangements have been recommended to the Scottish Government by independent, an independent expert advisory group in the report on the lessons learned for Scotland from the 2013 horsemeat food fraud scandal. The recommendations on seizure of food, the food hygiene information system and the administrative sanctions, uh, san sanctions have already been suggested, were already suggested last year by the Food Standards Agency in Scotland following a public consultation on new food law provisions. So, officer, we intend to lodge a small number of government amendments in light of the stage one proceedings to date. These will include, as the Health and Sport Committee will be aware, an amendment to the definition of food in the Bill to reflect the recently amended definition of food in the Scotland Act 1998. We also intend to follow the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee's recommendation to restrict the powers to regulate animal feeding stuffs in Section 35, 34 by introducing an amendment to cap the maximum penalty level for an offence created by this power. The Bill Sign Officer will ensure food safety is given the prominence it deserves in Scotland. By creating Food Standards Scotland and equipping it with the necessary functions and powers, it will be able to make expedient decisions focused on issues which specifically affect Scotland and to take action to improve the diet of the people of Scotland. I move that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Food Scotland Bill. Many, many thanks.
And I now call on Duncan McNeill to speak on behalf of the Health and Sport Committee. Mr McNeill, 10 minutes. Or thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And thank you for making it clear that I am speaking on behalf of the Health and Sport Committee, uh, although the topics of food, animal uh, feed and fish factories are not the normal bread and butter of our committee. That's the first pun. That's not the last, I'm afraid. Um, however, however um, I think it is opportune that we're having this debate uh, this week, uh, or this fortnight, the British Food Fortnight, um, so it does come at an opportune time. But more seriously, I, I, President Officer, I, I, from the work of our committee and our separate inquiries into health inequalities in Scotland, I'm pleased that the new food body will seek to address the key issues of diet and nutrition and their links with obesity and ill health. And we look forward to that ambition being achieved, because saying it and doing it, are, as we know, are different things. Earlier this year, the Health and Sport Committee therefore conducted an inquiry into the general principles of Food Scotland Bill. In producing our report, we drew on evidence received by the Finance and DPLR committees, and I thank those committees for their contributions. We held oral evidence sessions in May and June, and we received a valuable insight to some of the main issues during our visit to Aberdeen, where we met with uh, FSA representatives uh, of uh, the Rowett Institute of Nutrition and Health and the eminent microbiologist, Professor Hugh Pennington. And I would like to re record my thanks and the committee's thanks to all of those who gave evidence in person or in writing and indeed to everyone who engaged so fully with the committee in Aberdeen. I'm very grateful to SPICE and the committee clerks for their invaluable help in supporting the committee through its inquiry. Presiding officer, we received the government's uh, response to our report last Thursday. I'm grateful to the minister and his team for that uh, response and indeed for responding in good time to today's debate. Uh, we have heard from the Minister that the, the Bill seeks to establish a separate food body in Scotland, Food Services Scotland. This proposal was first muted during the so-called machinery of government changes in Whitehall. The UK government moved some of the Food Standards Agency responsibilities back into Whitehall departments. And following that, we had a smorgasbord of reviews, reports, um, consultations uh, from uh, the, the, the Scottish Government. They, w w they began, as we have heard from the Minister, with the Scudamore Review uh, to report on the merits of setting up a separate Scottish food agency. And then Jim Scudamore then delivered a further report on food standards and safety, as we have heard in the light of the horse meat incident in 2013. Before this bill was introduced, consultations were also undertaken by the Food Standards Agency and the Scottish Government. And finally, Ray Jones, Chair of Scottish, Scotland's Food and Drink, chaired the expert food group which focused on red meat and looked at the issues of traceability, labelling and provenance. The committee recognised the work of each of these reviews and we are certainly well satisfied that the bill has been subject to sufficient consultation. Presiding officer, the bill covers a number of areas. However, the new food body is very much the meat in the sandwich, so I will focus my remarks on that and on three areas in particular. Firstly, the committee received a considerable amount of evidence in relation to how Food Standards Scotland will operate in practice. Our report makes clear that there were a number of differing views on the proposed powers and scope of Food Standards Scotland. Nourish Scotland, for example, suggested that Food Standards Scotland should focus on improving the nation's diet and nutrition. The Scottish Food and Drink Federation, meanwhile, 
thought that the new body should play an active role in growing the food and drink industry in Scotland. Food for thought, presiding officer. On the latter point, we took the view that Scotland already had a great reputation for its food and drink, and that raising the standards of safety of our produce can only serve to further boost that reputation. The committee is satisfied, therefore, that the proposed powers and remit of Food Standards Scotland, and we are hopeful that these powers will de be deployed in a proportionate and appropriate way. Secondly, the committee spent some time considering the proposed structure of Food Standards Scotland. In particular, we received a lot of comment about the size and the makeup of the new bodies board. The bill stipulates that the board should have no fewer than three, nor more than seven members appointed by the Scottish ministers. Uh, the committee agreed with the many submissions, raising concerns that a board of three would be too small. The minister told us, however, that he envisages a similar setup to be equivalent to other public bodies with a membership of around eight. I'm grateful to the Minister for the reassurances he has offered us on that front. The committee is satisfied that the structure of the board, together with a duty to report to Parliament annually, provides sufficient level of accountability. The third area that we looked at in detail is that of how the new food body would interact with other institutions, both here in Scotland and around the UK and Europe. Bugs do not observe borders. We were reliably informed by Jim, Dr Jim Wildgoose, Chair of the Scottish Food Advisory Committee, stressing the need for the SSF to fit seamlessly into the network of food bodies in the United Kingdom and Europe. The Scottish Food and Drink Federation called for a consistent regulatory framework across the UK. The Scotch whisky industry called for a memorandum of understanding between the FSS and the FSA in the rest of the UK and the Scottish Retail Consortium issued a plea for a robust and transparent port protocol to be put in place to ensure that food businesses know what to expect from both the FSA and the FSA UK. The government response last week indicated that a memorandum of understanding was, in fact, in progress. Uh, and, and that is currently being drafted in time to be agreed in the incoming, by the incoming board of the new body in the new year, and that's to be welcomed. I understand that there is to be provision within that agreement for the S FSS to have full access to UK research, which I also very much welcome. Other evidence highlighted the fact that the large amount of food policy has its origins in Europe. So there will be an onus on the FSS to deliver an improved level of influence at a European level. The Minister has offered reassurance, reassurances that the FSS will have a wider role in coordinating food and nutrition research funded by the Scottish Government, and we we'll look forward to seeing that. We are also assured that the FSS will carry a, a strong voice in liaison with, on, on behalf of the Scottish research institutions to secure access to research funding from Europe. Likewise, the government response tells us that FSS will retain access to UK resources such as the FSA's advisory committees. Stakeholders such as Aberdeen's Rowett Institute will, I'm sure, be pleased to hear of those assurances. Presiding officer, the, com the committee found that the, there, there was near unanimous support for the bill. 
There are areas where we expect the Government to take on board evidence received from key stakeholders, and I am sure that the Minister will ensure that that happens. That aside, the Health and Sport Committee is content to recommend that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Food Scotland Bill. Thank you. Many thanks, Mr McNeill, and for your report, which contained a veritable punnet of puns. I now call on Dr Richard Simpson. Ten minutes are there by, Dr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I don't intend to compete with either yourself or Mr McNeill in terms of puns, but I do welcome the opportunity to speak in Stage 1 of the Food Scotland Bill. The background here, as the Minister said, is the 1999 Act establishing Food Standards Agency as a UK body, with the Scottish Ministers having authority at that time to direct the FSA in relation to its activities in Scotland. And that Act gave the FSA power to develop food policy, to audit enforcement, usually carried out by enforcement authorities as part of the local authorities' duties, and to carry out research and develop policy and give advice on food and feedstuffs. The Scottish section of the FSA, I think, has earned considerable respect amongst all those for whom it was acting and was in good standing with both government and public. Most recently, their independent work in relation to the food fraud and horsemeat scandal, I think, was regarded as of particular value. However, in 2010, as we've heard, when the new coalition government decided to split the FSA as a UK body, removing parts of its responsibility for nutrition and labelling in England, uh, then there was a need for us to consider what was going to happen in Scotland. Certainly, it is a matter for the Westminster Parliament to determine how they govern their affairs down there, but there was a general view that the split had somewhat hindered the response to the horsemeat scandal. And some of my Labour colleagues at Westminster uh, feel that the role of industry in respect of the functions of the previous FSA have increased, and this has not always been in a particularly helpful way. The Act we are considering today and, and first stage has arisen following the review, as we've heard, undertaken by Professor Jim Scudamore. And his clear advice, which the Government and my party fully accept, was that uh, food safety should not be divorced from nutrition and labelling. And moreover, advice on food safety, nutrition and meat inspection should come from a body at arm's length from the Scottish Ministers, and indeed that has been fully accepted and endorsed in the Act. My colleague Claire Baker will deal at greater length with the issue of meat inspection, which is an important part of the functions of the body. Um, and this certainly does remain of considerable importance, particularly those colleagues will remember the issue of BSE, the damage done to our meat exports here in Scotland following that outbreak. Claire Baker will also deal with concerns we have about uh, those dealing with, uh, charged with inspection and the squeeze on their numbers and the uh, difficulties they're facing. Lewis MacDonald will uh, uh, look at the role of the riot and, and issues around collaborative research and also the development of the mem memorandum of understanding which we've heard is being developed. But I want to deal, dwell, dwell briefly on two of the most important challenges facing public health in Scotland. Ever since we Scots gave up eating porridge as a regular part of our diet in the morning, we've increasingly adopted an unhealthy diet. Indeed, 140 years ago, Workers in my constituency went on strike because they were receiving salmon three times a week. And yet now, oily fish and salmon and herring being part of it is something which is only just beginning to regain in terms of salmon, uh, part of our diet. Our diet is still too high in saturated fats, too high in salt, with excessive amounts of sugar. And as our society has grown richer, we also have excessive portion sizes, not to mention substantial wood waste, uh, food waste. The results have been significant in contributing, along with smoking and alcohol, to Scotland being regarded as the sick man of Europe. Mortality from heart disease has declined, but that's mainly been due to smoking reduction. Now, the FSA has done a good job, in, with, along with industry, in reducing salt, salt levels, but we still have a long way to go to reach a healthy level in that aspect of our diet. Uh, can I have the thing that's flipped? Sorry, presiding officer, I've been having some trouble with my iPad so due for an upgrade no for some time. Thank you. The persistent, uh, the, the attempts to reformulate uh, um, foods to lower levels uh, remains very important, and I think that working with industry in that respect is going to be an important part of their work. On saturated fats, whilst excellent progress has been made in reducing the amount of trans fats, 
Members may remember that I proposed a private member's bill on trans fats to try and substantially eliminate their presence except in natural form. Uh, I believe that the uh, Scottish standards, uh, the new standards body will need to actually continue to address this issue rigorously, particularly in respect of takeaways, which I understand they're going to be reporting on shortly, uh, because these are more used by people in deprived communities and they do have substantial trans fats. Um, sugar is the final part of this equation, and this may, uh, this may be making a contribution in terms of calories to the problem of obesity. And while the rate of increase in the levels of obesity is now flattened, it does present one of the most serious challenges to Scots living healthier and longer lives, which is the ambition of the government and indeed ourselves. 27.8% of Scots are regarded as obese. This is greater than England and compares to southern European countries, which have an obesity level of around 15%, Japan only around 3.5%. And one of the main consequences of this um, uh, uh, um, epidemic of overweight is a substantial rise in type 2 diabetes, now thought to be affecting about a quarter of a million people in Scotland, and has resulted, for example, in an increase in amputations due to vascular disease associated with diabetes, increasing by 20% uh, in the last couple of years. The public cost of dealing with obesity, as the Minister has said, is predicted to rise to three billion by 2030. So the important remit of the uh, FSS is to improve the protection of the public from risks to health arising in connection with consumption of food and protection of other interests of consumers in relation to food. And these are all commendable objectives which we'd support, along with the new remit of improving the extent to which consumers have diets conducive to good health. The bill will put the current co uh, cooperation between the Food Standards Agency in Scotland, the Scottish Government and NHS Scotland in partnership onto a statutory basis. And when the bill is passed, the government, I understand, have undertaken to ensure that many of the suggestions that have been made in consultations for involvement directly by the FSA will be considered. These include more direct involvement in the regulation of animal health, animal byproducts, eggs, poultry, meat, organic food labelling and drinking water quality. And all of these are commendable, but I would suggest the government should proceed cautiously and not overload the FSS in its first year or two of operation uh, they will need to be properly financed for this. And I think the committee also expressed some caution in this regard. There are substantial challenges in foodborne infection and new challenges will arise which are presently unknown. But we must recognise that Scotland suffered one of the worst outbreaks of E. coli in Wishaw in the 90s. And although most lessons have been learned, Scotland still has a higher level of, this, of the dangerous E. coli than other home nations. Campylobacter in poultry has been admitted by the FSA as proving stubbornly difficult to control and will be an area that needs to be continued to be addressed. As the Minister said, if there are 50 deaths a year from, from uh, food poisoning, 2,000 admissions to hospital, but 130,000 consumers are suspected to be uh, affected by it, although the exact figure isn't known. Food hygiene continues to be important and following the Welsh and Northern Ireland example and building on our own experience will be important. But I would add also in the use of hormones and antibiotics. Antibiotic use in animals is not a new concern. The Swan report in the 60s advocated caution. But recent growing interest in our own human microbiome and our symbiotic relationship with billions of bacteria in our gut may reawaken interest in what antibiotics are being used in animals. Um, there are a number of other issues that have been raised uh, of concerns in the report of the committee, and these will be looked at in stage two. The minister has uh, mentioned the uh, question of appeals against certain uh, um, uh, convictions or, or, or acts, and the Scottish Grocers Federation has raised that issue, and I'm glad that there are going to be consideration of, of the appeal system. The Scottish Whiskey Association has also raised concerns about an appeal process, so this will be looked at in stage two. One final area I want to refer to is the promotion of, uh, of Scotland's food and drink industry. This is clearly an area of substantial importance for Scotland. Our exports are, are, are good and growing, but our recognition as a place of excellent food is absolutely of fundamental importance. I was recently in France, where I was able to observe in French markets French, uh, Scottish salmon, identified from all the other sources of salmon because it has the La Belle Rouge, and it is the only salmon that actually has that. This sort of uh, 
uh, appellation is absolutely vital to us going forward. And so I welcome the fact that the FSS is going to play an important role in this. So in conclusion, uh, presiding officer, this uh, proposed newly independent corporate body will, I hope, be able to provide the necessary leadership and advice on issues of nutrition to create a fitter and healthier community as the 21st century progresses. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Dr. Nanette Milne, six minutes or thereby. Dr. Thank Milne. you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In this day and age when so many of us rely increasingly on processed food and re ready prepared meals, it is crucially important that we can trust the safety and nutritious value of the food that we eat. The Food Standards Agency has served us well in this regard until now, but given the changing remit of the FSA south of the border, the need to tackle the serious problems of obesity in Scotland caused by an inappropriate dietary lifestyle. And in the wake of the horse meat fraud, the Scottish Government, as we know, proposes to set up Food Standards Scotland as a new standalone body in Scotland to replace the FSA and with wider powers than that body has. Whilst not all consultees were in favour of this proposal, the majority of people who responded to the call for evidence agreed that this is the way forward, and Scottish Conservatives too are supportive of the general principles of the Bill. With its three key objectives, of protecting the public from risks to health which may arise in connection with food consumption, of improving the extent to which the public have diets which are conducive to good health, and of protecting other consumer interests in relation to food, the new FSS body would have a broader remit than that of the existing FSA in Scotland, and it would also have powers in relation to wrongly labelled food and non-compliance with food law. The policy memorandum states that the new body will bring the FSA's existing public health protection role together with a new objective on diet and nutrition. And the Minister in oral evidence said the proposed legislation will allow Food Standards Scotland to work in a coordinated way with the NHS and other organisations which have a role to play in the obesity and dietary challenges that we face in Scotland. The proposed powers for the new agency in respect of diet and nutrition were generally welcomed by witnesses, but given that there are a number of other existing bodies which also have a role in this area, they stressed the need for FSS to have a strong coordination and leadership role. How this will be achieved will largely depend on negotiations after the new body is in place, and there are concerns that the work of FSS and the relevant NHS bodies must be appropriately coordinated in order to best tackle the complexities of diet and nutrition in Scotland. The Scottish Government sees this as an opportunity to clear up confusion over the roles and responsibilities of different stakeholders, and to base advice to the public on sound scientific evidence. However, there is clearly a great deal of work to be done after the legislation is in place, and I think ministers should heed the Royal Society of Edinburgh's caveat that to achieve its dietary and nutrition goals, FSS must be adequately resourced and well connected to the government's scientific advisors. There are some concerns about financing of FSS, whose extra powers beyond those of the existing FSA are likely to cost an extra five million or so in the first year. It is intended that the increased running costs will be offset through a financial transfer to the Scottish Government from the FSA UK-wide budget. But the exact value of this is still under negotiation. And whilst the Minister assured me at committee that negotiations have been straightforward and he's confident of a satisfactory outcome, they will not actually be complete until after the incoming FSS board is in place, predict predicted to be early next year. And of course, any future extension of the remit of FSS could have financial implications for the body itself and even for local authorities. To my so to my mind, there are still significant uncertainties about the funding of the new body, which will be crucial to its success. A clear theme emerging from evidence to the committee was the need for FSS to have access to the best science to underpin policy, pointing out the extensive diet and nutrition expertise within the food industry, academia, and national bodies such as NHS Health Scotland, which should be accessible to FSS, and also expert committees like the Scottish Food Enforcement Liaison Committee and food-related research from UK government sources. Professor Peter Morgan of the Rowett Research Institute and Professor Hugh Pennington on behalf of the RSE both highlighted the need to maintain existing links to the advisory committees to the UK Food Agency, noting that a lot of work is going on in the UK and across Europe, and the advisory committees can pull this together and give advice through FSS as an independent body. The great opportunities for Scotland through Horizon 2020 funding were also stressed by Professor Morgan. 
So the memorandum of understanding between FSA and FSS currently being drafted with its protocols on science and research setting out the arrangements for these bodies to work together where appropriate and to exchange data and research findings in all areas of mutual interest will be crucially important to the success of the new body and I look forward to the promised publication of the agreed MOU at the earliest opportunity. Presiding officer, other issues raised with the committee include the governance of FSS, particularly the size of the board in charge of its work, proposed sanctions for food law offences, the possibility of setting up an appeals process against fixed penalty notices, which the minister has referred to, measures to tackle food fraud, and a possible negative impact on Scottish food businesses should we develop a different labelling regime from the rest of the United Kingdom. Time is too short to deal with these in detail, but no doubt any un unanswered concerns will be raised as the Bill proceeds through Parliament. Finally, there was general support for a mandatory food hygiene information scheme to be set up in the future and, ex and an acceptance that the Government should monitor such schemes in Northern Ireland and Wales before finally committing to such a scheme for Scotland. So, Presiding Officer, there are still significant issues to be resolved in the complex area of food, nutrition and diet. But I'm satisfied, together with my fellow com committee members, that to set up Food Standards Scotland is the right way forward. The detail of the legislation will be examined further in stages two and three of the parliamentary process. But I am happy to accept the general principles of the Food Scotland Bill. Thank you. Many thanks. And we now move to open debate. We have a little time in hand, so there will certainly be time for interventions. Uh, I call on Aileen MacLeod first, to be followed by Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, I welcome the opportunity to speak in this afternoon's debate. And I'd like to begin by thanking uh, the committee's convener, uh, Duncan McNeill, for his opening remarks, and also by thanking all the stakeholders across local government, the NHS, our food and drink producers, the industry, our regulated bodies, and many others who provided written and oral evidence to the Health and Sport Committee, which assisted us greatly in our scrutiny of the bill at stage one. This is an important bill, presenting officer, and I am pleased to see that there is general consensus over its broad principles and what it is trying to achieve. And as others have said already, it will establish a single independent body to ensure that the former functions of the Food Standards Agency remain together, allowing for clear responsibility and accountability for all aspects of food safety and standards which can only be benefit beneficial for our consumers in Scotland, while also, and I think crucially, helping us to tackle the serious public health issues surrounding obesity. Now, this bill also learns from the lessons of the 2013 horsemeat scandal and many of the measures recommended by the two expert working groups tasked with reviewing what went wrong in our food chain have been incorporated into the bill. And I also uh, welcome the Scottish Government's response to the Committee Stage 1 report and in particular the clarification which the Government has provided on the envisaged role of the Food Standards Scotland in relation to diet and nutrition, accessing European research funding and the research functions of the new body. Now, I want in particular, presenting officer, to focus on section two of the bill, which sets the objectives of Food Standards Scotland and includes a new objective on diet. And it says to improve the extent to which members of the public have diets which are conducive to good health. Now, as the Minister said in his remarks, uh, obesity in Scotland presents a significant and growing public health challenge. And regrettably, we are near the top of the OECD league tables for obesity. We are, in my view, uh, very aware as a Parliament of the contribution that obesity makes to the incidence of other potentially serious long-term conditions, including type 2 diabetes, heart disease, osteoarthritis, and some various forms of cancers. So I do welcome the principle that the FSS will have a new focus on diet and nutrition, since obesity can't be viewed simply as a health issue alone, and neither will we tackle it successfully if we only rely on creating behavioural change. Now, the causes of the increase in obesity are complicated, and the efforts to address this trend will require coordination and collaboration across the various sectors. And I think many people will tend to associate food standards with food safety, hygiene and cleanliness, but not necessarily with improving the extent to which the public have uh, diets conducive to good health. So the inclusion 
of the objective on uh, diet nutrition, I'm pleased to see, was also supported in the evidence the committee received from the Soil Association, the James Hutton Institute, BMA Scotland, the Royal Society of Edinburgh and Quality Meat Scotland. Now, presenting officer linked to the competency of the SSS over diet and nutrition is also the potential role which it can play in influencing the EU agenda, working together with various uh, Scottish research institutes and research groups, not least in terms of identifying uh, and accessing research opportunities both at a UK and an EU level. And I also welcome uh, the, Scottish, in the Scottish Government's response, the memorandum of understanding that's being developed between the FSA and the FSS to ensure that the latter has full access to UK research. Now, the creation of the FSS is an opportunity to build more formal and effective working relationships with the appropriate UK and EU agencies. And the new body will, of course, be able to collaborate, cooperate and share intelligence with other organisations in Scotland, the UK and Europe. And clearly, this will be valuable should we ever see a repeat of international food fraud incidents such as the horse meat scandal. But it will also allow for a similar approach to research. In Scotland, we already have expertise that others need, for example, on shellfish and highly regarded research into food and diet, such as that has been carried out by the James Hutton Institute. And we have a lot to offer in that regard, as well as much to gain. And indeed, as my other uh, committee colleague, uh, Annette Millen, said in her remarks, there are substantial potential opportunities for Scotland's research and scientific communities arising out of the EU's new Horizon 2020 research funding programme. The issue of food security is one of the grand societal challenges that's identified by the EU to be supported in the context of this programme, with research work focusing on food and healthy diet. Now, the Horizon 2020 statement on that theme refers to social and economic access to safe and nutritious food, which to me reflects very well the diet and nutrition objective which FSS is to have in its remit. So the creation of Food Standards Scotland Planning Officer affords us a wider opportunity to not only plug Scotland into that developing pan-European research, but also ensures that Scotland is ideally placed to make a significant contribution to what is one of the major challenges that is facing our society today. And this is an opportunity as significant, I suggest, as the work that we've been doing on our integration of health and social care for adults, which is helping us to make the case very strongly for Scotland to become an international centre of excellence in research into healthy and active ageing using digital health solutions. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I look forward to the bill proceeding to stage two and to the committee's further discussions around the bill, and I'm happy to support the general principles of the bill this afternoon. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Claire Baker to be followed by Christian Allard. Um, thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to be taking part in this afternoon's debate. Uh, the bill sets out the oper operational detail for Food Standards Scotland, and I think everyone in the Chamber supports the general principles of that. But I'd like to make just one point <coughs> around membership of the Board. Uh, while the Committee supports the Government proposal on the Board's membership and doesn't support the proposals for sectoral representatives, I would ask the Minister to reflect on the report from the Mather Commission that the Scottish Government welcomed at the time that recommends employee directors for public uh, body boards. I think the establishment of um, Food Standards Scotland does give the Government an opportunity to act on this. And I would suggest, given the particular responsibilities of Food Standards Scotland and the, the key importance of the consumer within that, that it would be important to have employee representation in some form on the, on the board. Um, while the Food Standards Bill has been scrutinised by the Health Committee, and it is the Public Health Minister putting the case to us today, it is an organisation whose responsibility extends also to the food inspection regime in Scotland, covering work in abattoirs and meat plants, as well as issues around accurate labelling and food fraud. And these are the issues that I wish to focus on this afternoon. 
Um, a few weeks ago, I spoke at the Scotsman Conference on food and drink during Food and Drink Fortnight. And at that conference, there was a clear emphasis on Scotland's strong brand, our international reputation, providence and transparency within our food sector. A recognition that if Scotland's food and drink sector is to grow and make a significant contribution to Scotland's economy and offer quality employment opportunities, these strengths must be promoted and protected. The establishment of a new food standards body, and we all support the necessity for a separate Scottish body for the reasons that have been outlined by others, gives us an opportunity to be clear about what our expectations are on the operations of the food sector in Scotland and be prepared to introduce a robust regulatory regime that puts the consumer firmly at its centre. There are some real challenges in the sector. It is a tough sector. Food production is highly competitive. It operates on very narrow profit margins and we can see the impact of that within Scotland. We've recently seen the termination of four free-range chicken uh, producers' contracts with two sisters. This will result in the total number of independent chicken producers in Scotland falling from 28 to 16, and the number of chickens produced in Scotland falling by 7 million birds. Yet this is a time when we are seeing chicken consumption is increasing. So we all recognise the pressures that are on food producers, rising prices, um, pressure from the supermarkets, and increasing competition from overseas but we cannot allow this to lead to any weakening of our regulation. And we have seen a fall in the number of meat inspectors and inspections in recent years. And all these factors are there really to protect the consumer, but they also protect Scotland's brand and reputation. And a recent Bank of Scotland report into the food and drink sector found that 64% of those questions identified regulation and compliance as a significant challenge for their sector. But any damage to our sector, which is left vulnerable with light touch regulation, would take years to recover from, and we know that from recent examples. We need to ensure this reputation, this well-earned reputation, is protected, and while all effort must be made to have proportionate regula regulation, it must also be robust and effective. So if we look at some of the realities within the sector, a recent FOI carried out by Unison Scotland showed that from April 2012, meat inspectors and vets have prevented over a million cases of diseased animal carcasses entering into the food chain. This included 659,000 instances of liver fluke parasite and 427,000 instances of pneumonia in red meat carcasses. These are pretty concerning figures, but the fact that we have an inspection regime means these diseased carcasses are being detected before they are reaching the human food chain. There isn't, other people have referred to it, there is intense lobbying at EU level for a lighter touch regulation, which increasingly looks to pass the responsibility from the public sector to the industry. And there are real concerns about the consequences of this for the consumer. And already 37 out of the 87 poultry plants across the UK have now employed their own meat inspectors, which for me raises issues around um, accountability and around conflict of interest. The creation of a new body in Scotland gives us an opportunity to ensure that that body acts in the interests of the consumer. Two of its objectives clearly emphasise the protection of the consumer, and while measures must be proportionate and they must support the industry, they must also be able to demonstrate that they deserve the public's trust, and trust must be at the heart of this new body. It needs to be able to hold the confidence of the public, and if sections of the industry are failing, certainly we need to work with them to challenge that and to raise those standards, but they also need to be transparent and accountable. Meat inspectors and vets must be able to carry out thorough independent inspections free from food sector influence. And of course there are those in the sector who recognise this and recognise the value of that system. But you only need to speak to some people who are working on the factory floor to get an understanding of how tough the sector can be, how the working conditions are pretty hard, how pressurised the sector is to produce the end product quickly, um, to understand how tough that sector is, how, how difficult it can be to go in and, um, and enact that inspection regime, to understand how essential it us is to have a robust regulatory regime with independent scrutiny. And the new body, the Food Standards Scotland, must have a clear position on this and support their staff who are working at the sharp end. Because another reality of this is it's the lower end produce which is more vulnerable, the lower end of the, of the sector. The demand for cheap food from the retail sector and from the consumer does put pressure on the sector. But we cannot allow the low income consumer to be left vulnerable to poor practice. And the growth in food fraud um, recently been highlighted, ranging from counterfeiting, uh, mislabeling, substitution, is also a significant challenge for the new body to address. 
Um, I want to close with some concerns over environmental health officers, um, in particular issues of capacity and underfunding. At the height of the horsemeat scandal a few years ago, the pressure on local authority services became clear, and budgetary pressures meant that um, in 2008 there were over 16,000 food safety samples being taken across Scotland, and by 2012 that had dropped to just over 10,000 samples, and there had also been a 21% drop in the number of specialist food safety officers who are employed by local authorities. Um, and there is just increasingly not the capacity there to carry out any kind of regular checks. And if we want them to deliver a service which meets the challenges of the modern world, it really does need to be better supported, not just by local government who are facing financial pressures, but also by central government and by the Food Standards Scotland body. So this bill establishes the legal standing of the Food Standards Scotland. The future debate will now move on to around policy and practice of the new body. And if we are prepared to put the interests of the consumer first, everyone, including the industry, will benefit from the advantages of safe, high-quality, respected and trusted Scottish produce. Well Many thanks. And I would once again offer up the opportunity to the Chamber to remind them that we do have time for interventions today, and should people even wish to develop their ideas and thinking as the debate develops, then this, on this day would be welcome. I now call on Christian Allard to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I first uh, add my thanks to the uh, committee convener, Nicole McLean, and to the members of the committee for their work in compiling this stage one report on the Food Scotland Bill. I'm particularly pleased that the committee chose to come to Aberdeen. The past few months, Aberdeen has been in the media spotlight. I never stopped reminding journalists that there is more than one booming sector in the North East of Scotland. Food and drink in Scotland is much more than an economic driver. It is part of this country's fabric and culture, part of our past, our present, and our future. And of course, the North East is at the very heart of it. The North East of Scotland is Scotland's natural larder. President Officer, I don't feel ready yet to be speaking on diet and obesity as I have not followed the First Minister's advice of moderating my food intake. So I'll pass and let uh, other members talk about uh, diet and obesity. The only comment I will make today uh, is the quantity of food uh, some of us are eating is mostly the problem that we are struggling to cope with. Uh, eat less and better quality food will be the advice I must follow. Uh, unlike Duncan McHill, I worked uh, in the food industry for the last 30 years, and it was my bread and butter uh, for many, many years. Uh, I will concentrate in this debate uh, on food safety, the implementation of food regulations, and the enforcement of those regulations. My plea to all members of this parliament is to support our food industry, like some uh, members have done uh, before me, and remind Scottish consumers to buy locally and to eat safe and nutritious food Scottish food. Let's be clear, the consensus that emerged in this stage one report is that the present situation has been made untenable by the direction taken by the Westminster government. A lot has been said about a particular food scare. In, I note that in the oral evidence, uh, Ewell Morton from Quality, Quality Meat Scotland stated, I quote, as we know from the horse meat scandal, the substitution of beef with horse meat in ready meals and burgers occurred further down the chain. It was not committed in the UK. It happened in Ireland, in the case of the burgers, and in France, to my shame, with a background in the, uh, in the Nether Netherlands. It was a complicated international food fraud, he added. Yes, of course. Baker. Father. Mr. Baker, microphone, please. Uh, while the member is correct in his de description of the horsemeat scandal, does he recognise that still um, within Scotland there are um, substitutions, whether there's been cases of white fish, there's been cases of lamb being substituted for meat, particularly in the, the restaurant sector? So that I think this is still an issue that even though horsemeat scandal is linked to Scotland, we still have issues with food fraud and substitution that we need to deal with here. I would agree with the, with the member on that particular point on the restaurant, and I did. I did. Uh, 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 I would encourage anybody uh, when they buy, for example, the, the catch of the day, that they do ask where the fish comes from, because they'll be surprised. Sometimes it comes from the other side of the world, so catch of the day cannot be coming from the other side of the world. So that's important, yes, especially as 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 a, as a consumer point, that we know exactly where, where the food comes from. 
Uh, what is important, President Officer, uh, that is very important, President Officer, because of the same time in Aberdeen, on the same time that we had the food scared, in Aberdeen, a local authority was stopping the export of seafood because of a wrong label. Not that the content of the seafood boxes was different of what the label said, but the shipment was stopped because the label was not seen as following all EU rules and regulations. And believe you me, I worked 30 years in the food industry, and the labeling is a nightmare because rules and regulations change all the time. And sometimes you have to ask yourself, you know, who is directing these things? And people have to be known in the profession, in the food and drink industry, what the rules are, and that's very, very important. Uh, I, I would say, President Officer, uh, in short, that there was nothing wrong with the product at that particular time. The name of the product was clearly on the label, but all the I's and all the T's were not dotted and crossed to the liking of the local authority. A local authority that had no idea of ex existing food label laws. Uh, Claire Becker talked about uh, funding. You know, I think maybe there is a point where uh, priorities, some local authorities are maybe not prioritizing uh, 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 this, this, this part of spending. Uh, there must be a better way of enforcing legislation. Because of the report pointed out in its summary, I quote, few witnesses questioned the creation of the new food body and instead sought assurances about its working practices. The National Farmers Union Scotland was another organisation very supportive of the Scottish Government intentions to bring back powers to Scotland. There is a lot I like in the recommendations and changing sections 2.3 and 15.1 of the bill. Food standards Scotland must be both transparent and objective, and the way it goes about its business, in the way it goes about its business. Better consultation, cooperation, coordination, and the recording of the decision made is what we all expect when moving those services from south of the border. The word leadership, the word leadership to coordinate uh, relevant laws and regulation is where I want to see the new Food Standards Scotland Agency to operate. It is lack of leadership that sometimes brought us where we are. Let's make sure this bill supports Scottish producers, and let's not forget that what makes our food industry in Scotland is first the producer, then the retailer, and more importantly, the consumer. I happen to disagree with Mr. Morton from Quality Meat Scotland when he argued the retailer is a soft target. The retailer, in fact, is the right person to target if we want the consumer to have confidence when purchasing food, wherever the food comes from, from abroad or from Scotland. As I said, I was very impressed with the committee's visit to a seafood producer base in Aberdeen. I know Michael Robertson very well, the managing director, and all in the seafood sector shares concern about increasing cost associated with the bill. We need the reinsurance for the minister today that having different systems in Scotland and the rest of the UK doesn't automatically mean higher food costs. Scotland doesn't operate in a vacuum, at home or abroad. Our Scottish producers have to be able to compete. A new labelling and regulation in Scotland must be accepted in the rest of the UK and in the EU, EU before to be enforced. They need to be clear, they need to be transparent. I agree with Michael Robertson, there must be some discussion about inspections because local authorities' inspections is not of high quality standard. I want to move away from retailers dictating to Scottish producers, like it's happening just now in the food industry. And I'm asking the Food Standards Scotland to take leadership of a, a major retailers on this point. The members of the committee wrote that they would hope that Food Standards Scotland would exercise its powers in a proportional and appropriate way that would protect the the prospect of sustainable growth generated by the industry themselves. I would like this sentiment to be more than hope. I would like this bill, when completed, to be a guarantor to the sustainable growth of our food and drinks industry. I have been very much encouraged with the support received from the food producers in Scotland, recognising that the Scottish Government is moving in the right direction. With this bill, let's have a food standards agency in Scotland fit for the fantastic food and drink sector that we have and fit for the 21st century. Bravo. Thank you very much. I now call on Bob Doris to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I start off by echoing, as my, my convener Duncan McNeill has, our thanks to everyone who gave evidence to the committee and the clerking team, in spite of all the support that they've presented us. It's only fair that we should put that on the record that at this time, I'd like to start off by saying a little bit about access to research, to evidence, to science, and to advice that other members have also 
spoken about. We have heard much about making sure we still have access to the relevant UK experts. And I think it is also worth noting that sometimes those relevant UK experts actually happen to be in Scotland. And indeed, sometimes the experts are not in the UK at all, but they are they're elsewhere within Europe. It became clear to, to me fairly quickly that the Food Standards Scotland would not have a, a narrow horizon in relation to research, to evidence, to science and to advice. And it was clear that the scientific community and the research community is global and actually borders are increasingly irrelevant. In our Stage 1 report, the Health and Sport Committee within Sections 69 to 74 supported that view. And it was endorsed by the Minister, who made it clear that there had been a very good working relationship with the FSA at a UK level from the outset, and that a memorandum of understanding with the FSA is being developed. Um, so I would almost have taken that for granted, but it's good to have that uh, firmed up for, for the avoidance of doubts. That, 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 that is good progress. It's also worth stressing that such a memorandum will involve the rest of the UK, as I've said before, seeking advice from Scottish-based experts, experts as important. So it's not, a, it's not one way traffic. There's a self-interest from the rest of the UK in having this memorandum of understanding as well. Sections 78 to 84 in our Stage 1 report also outlines broad support for this support, but actually, I think, goes a, a step further. It leads us to consider the huge opportunities to actually develop research and expertise in Scotland. At, at Section 81, Professor Peter Morgan of the Rowett Institute of Nutrition and Health said, great opportunities for Scotland is coming through Horizon 2020, funding, I understand, there's billions of pounds of research money available in that presiding officer. And they also remarked that Food Standards Scotland should have a definite role in trying to influence what research is done. So a key role for this new organisation and a key economic role as well as food standards role with our higher education institutions and accessing funding across Europe and beyond. I know the Minister agreed with it, but actually uh, support to go even further than that came from another source that came from Tim, Tim Smith from Tesco and he's quoted uh, section 84 within a report who said, I encourage more boldness and suggest that the new body will want, not just want to access but influence. Some issues will be more important in Scotland than the other parts of the United Kingdom. The new body will need to ensure that these priorities are met with the same enthusiasm as they are just now. Actually, so one of the key things I would like to know is how this new body can be proactive to be specialists in certain uh, food standards issue across Europe, across the world, in research and development, massive opportunities to, to direct that. Uh, Presiding officer, on a more local level, I suppose, to all of us, I'd like to look a little bit uh, at section 32 within the bill, which creates uh, new provisions related to contravention of food information laws. In many cases, if put in plain English, uh, presiding officer, we're talking about is food fraud. So it may seem trivial to some, but you know, if you go down the local um, uh, chip shop and pay five pounds for a fish supper and you think you're getting haddock, you should get haddock. It's an offence if you're not. Uh, as we've heard earlier on, if you go for a meal with your family and order a, a lamb curry, you want to make sure what's actually in there is what you think's in there. I'm not talking about food safety, presiding officer. I'm talking about food fraud and yeah, misinformation. Yes, of course. Stuart Stevenson. Um, the member is right to highlight this, and it's far from trivial, and it's not just domestic. Uh, I've seen CAT 69, which certainly didn't come out of the VAT 69 factory in South Queensbury in Nepal. I've seen the trade in second-hand Johnny Walker bottles in India, and I've seen Coke bottles being refilled in a back street in Hebron in the West Bank. Major brands attract fraud across the world, and I think uh, we can play a role domestically in setting a standard and protecting the value of brands that we earn so much money from, because this is far from being a trivial problem. Thank you. Bob Donis. I can maybe uh, reassure the member that since I got married about two and a half years ago, there's uh, certainly less uh, recyclable Johnny Walker bottles lying about um, my house, that's for sure. But he does, of course, make a, a serious point, and that is that um, this food fraud, for example, doesn't actually start with the retailer. The retailer is quite often the end point of a complex web of, of uh, criminal activity across the globe, and it's about that traceability 
and accountability. I know some retailers feel as if they have perhaps been overly scrutinised for offences elsewhere, but they do have a duty to report. And if a deal is too good to be true, they should know it's too good to be true, quite frankly, so they can't shut the responsibilities either. I would like to point out that I was quite surprised to find out that uh, mislabeled food or food fraud, the courts couldn't step in and confiscate that food. It was actually easier to confiscate hooky trainers than a dodgy doner kebab. That sounds like a, a bizarre thing to say, but it was the case, and this new law will change that. I would not like to see this food destroyed, of course. If it is safe, then let us give it to homeless people, let us give it to food banks, let us put it somewhere where it can be used for benefit. Um, a couple of uh, things I would like to say in, in closing. Uh, I do support uh, the scheme of fixed penalty notices, and I think um, that will be quite well uh, received by local authorities who have to prosecute criminal offences. And I, do, I, I would not read out the full quote for time constraints, presiding officer, but William Hamilton from Trade and Standards at Glasgow City Council said it would be a boon to them uh, fixed penalty notices rather than complex court proceedings. I think the final thing I will say is that I know ministers are taking the provision through guidance if they choose to make sure there is a mandatory food hygiene information scheme uh, and displayed in all food outlets. I would encourage that to be rolled out uh, as soon as possible in a way that does not put a business constraint on many local businesses, but I think it should just be standard when you walk into a place where food and drink is available that you can just see at a glance what level that place is operating at. But I do point out that I know we sometimes target the end point of uh, bad practice with uh, food and drink uh, uh, systems across Scotland, across Britain and across Europe. And in closing, we should remember that actually, of course, presiding officer, the vast majority of food and drink producers and processors in Scotland do an outstanding job, as do retailers. But these powers are necessary, not just to keep that standard, but to improve it further. Thank you very much. And I now call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Colin Keir. Uh, officer, I congratulate the Government on bringing forward this bill. Establishing Food Standards Scotland as a standalone body is clearly the most viable uh, option based on the recommendations of the Scudamore and other reviews and building on the existing expertise and best practice of the Food Standards Agency. I also congratulate the Committee uh, and support their recommendations. One that particularly interested me was the request for clearer detail on the proposed research functions and capability of the FSS and how they will relate to UK funded research bodies. It reminded me of the rationale for setting up uh, the FSA as a UK body in the first place. The 1998 consultation document said, for example, and I quote, the government believes that a single body to control and regulate food safety and standards in the UK is appropriate because it would be impractical and costly to duplicate the necessary scientific advice in all parts of the UK. I was therefore reassured by uh, Duncan McNeill when he referred to the memorandum of understanding that is in progress uh, and the guarantee of access to UK research. So I think that is an important uh, development. Uh, Duncan McNeill also referred to the committee's approval of uh, an eight-person board. Uh, they welcomed the minister's reassurance on that. But can I take this opportunity of backing up what Claire Baker said about the Mather Commission and the merits of having an employee director? And of course, I don't need to uh, give a lesson to the minister on that, because of course, uh, many, if not most, health bodies already have uh, an employee uh, director. Uh, Claire Baker, if we needed reminded, uh, 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 mentioned the invaluable work that uh, people on the ground do, and then she particularly re referred to the meat inspectors who presided, uh, prevented over one million instances of diseased animal carcasses entering the food chain. So I hope the Minister will consider that proposal for an employee director. Now, it's no secret that many in Scotland have difficulties with weight and health, and much of this relates to the quality of our diet. A preventative approach is clearly essential, and clear and reliable nutrition advice through labelling of food is one uh, important part of that. That is why it should be welcomed that labelling will be made a priority when the new body is formed next year. Having a standalone body that addresses the regulation of food standards will allow us to place emphasis on our national health priorities and protect Scottish consumers while also avoiding the UK's rather fragmented approach to food standards as a whole since 2010. 
It's not entirely clear why the different responsibilities were sectioned off to different departments in the way that they were. In fact, the review panel, under the guidance of Professor Scudamore, along with many stakeholders, made the point that FSA UK had functioned well prior to the UK Government's machinery of government changes in 2010. What is clear is that a joined-up approach that recognises the connections between different areas of monitoring and maintaining food standards and the overall health priorities of the government will be required if we are to address issues like obesity and tackle lapses in food quality. As the Scudamore Review concludes, Scotland has unique and complex problems in relation to diet, obesity and certain foodborne diseases, and this means that food safety and regulation should not be divorced from nutrition and labelling and standards. In this respect, the extended remit of the FSS will require substantial extra resources. The financial memorandum states that there will be a direct transfer of existing staff from the FSA to the FSS. However, the Minister has also indicated that the remit of the new body will go beyond that of the current functions uh, of the FSA. To this end, I hope that the Government will produce an update before Stage 2 on the budgetary negotiations with the UK Government and give further assurances that future expansion of the FSS's role will be appropriately resourced. As the Scottish Government 2010 report Preventing Overweight and Obesity in Scotland points out, evidence suggests that the provision of health information, although important, is not sufficient and that to make the changes necessary we have to reshape our living environment from one that promotes weight gain to one that supports healthy choices. By broadening the scope of the FSS to prioritise an evidence-based approach that allows a greater understanding of what leads to poor diets and ill health, we can go beyond monitoring quality and labelling to promoting health and tackling health inequalities on a broader front. It is important, however, that any existing staff receive the appropriate level of upskilling to allow them to deliver any new changes. The concern reflected in a small number of responses to the consultation was that it would be preferable, perhaps, to allow some time to pass to allow the new body to bed in before expanding the remit to include public health issues more generally. That is perhaps a prudent suggestion and one that may be worth considering as the Bill moves forward. Indeed, there is much to be considered in the Scottish Government's further suggestions on the additional work of the FSS, much of which has merit, but perhaps all of which will require careful consideration as to what is feasible. It has been suggested that the scope of the body could include considerations of environment, provenance, sustainability, food security, or tracking and measuring food poverty. Indeed, this last suggestion is intriguing, and I look forward to hearing more on how the additional work will link in with uh, current responsibilities and who within the new body will ensure its role is coordinated with the existing programmes and priorities of the NHS. There is still a lack of clarity on that and as the Committee Stage 1 report suggests, the onus is on the Scottish Government to, and I quote again, take any necessary steps to ensure coordination between the work of the FSS and relevant NHS uh, uh, bodies. Widening the scope of the new FSS provides an opportunity uh, for the new body to lead on a national response to the problem of food poverty in particular, thereby helping to confront one of the most pressing public health problems that we face. There are various ways that this may be achieved, but key to this is partnership working between local authorities and the FSS. Earlier this week, the Finance Committee discussed the connection between achieving national outcomes in the performance framework and implementation of measures at a local authority level. There was a great deal of discussion as to how budgets could be allocated combining national ambitions with effective partnership working to achieve a healthier and more equal uh, Scotland. This is a policy that could be highly effective in challenging some of the major health problems facing Scotland if it is implemented with the partnership working that local authorities desire. In conclusion, our relationship to food as a nation is fundamentally linked to many of our health issues. Gaining an understanding that safety and regulation should not be divorced from nutrition and labelling will hopefully translate to a more holistic approach to maintaining standards and promoting health. On that basis, I am happy to support the Bill at Stage 1. Many thanks. I now call Colin Keir to be followed by Jane Baxter. <coughs> uh, thank you, uh, Deputy presiding officer. Um, can I first of all thank uh, Duncan McNeill for his chairmanship of the committee during this, my colleagues in the committee uh, who have uh, 
gone through this uh, stage one process, and I have to say it's been one of the most interesting things we've done. What effectively everyone thought was a fairly standard uh, thing to have in terms of the Food Standards Agency and uh, now Food Standards Scotland. Um, and what we actually found, the further that we took it on, the more it brought in, more problems that it brought in, everything from the producer at the low end right the way up to the retailer, and indeed how the, uh, those people within that chain of uh, supply actually felt about the FSS. Should it, you know, at what point does uh, uh, regulation kick in to penalise severely those who uh, have done something wrong to those who feel that the over-regulation effectively means that they're being discriminated against. The producers who are looking for a lighter touch regulation because they feel that the local authorities already have enough power to come in and do work within their companies. Um, and it's this thing that actually makes it so diverse because there is no one view. Everybody wants to have this, but there are different views with, within the system. And certainly, I think that was uh, uh, found to be the case on a number of occasions. And indeed, looking at the stuff that I had never actually uh, thought about before in terms of the regulation of animal food stuff that's been mentioned by various members, and you take it right away through the, the, the entire system to where Christian Allard is, uh, is years in the food industry and, and his vision of how regulation should be. I, don't, I think it's very difficult to get absolute um, uh, agreement from everyone. Certainly, uh, the committee made a, a trip, a very interesting trip up to Aberdeen um, uh, earlier part of the year, uh, where we visited uh, people from uh, Food Standards Agency as well as uh, various other agencies, such as the Rowe Institute, uh, has been mentioned. And, of course, we ended up visiting uh, Joseph Robertson, uh, food processors up there. And I really wasn't aware, as someone who, as you can probably imagine, over the years has not been a, a stranger to a fish supper, and perhaps I should stop. Uh, where does some of this fish come from? How do you identify it? How do you track it? How do you ensure its quality? And in terms of um, uh, food safety, you don't realise. I was astonished to find that something like uh, £140 million pounds a year it costs in, in terms of uh, uh, damage uh, uh, to this economy with 2,000 people uh, hospitalised. I couldn't quite get that through my, my head at the time. And you don't realise the overall effect on the economy. It's not just the food industry. And the food industry has been pointed out by many, many people here today, has got a phenomenal reputation. And yet we've had to endure stuff, uh, uh, incidents such as the uh, the Wishaw, Wishaw E. coli uh, outbreak and, of course, the, the horse meat scandal of last year. And it also brings to... I'm really interested in terms of how we actually enforce the, uh, uh, this act because some of the comments that were made, obviously, by retailers who feel mildly discriminated against in some ways, uh, certainly they the opposite view was taken by the uh, officers from Glasgow Council, as Bob Doris uh, pointed out, who, who said that these fixed penalties and uh, <coughs> excuse me, suffering from a bit of a, a throat this week, um, the fixed penalties and compliance notices that could be uh, used is a boon to them. It's fantastic. But they have a problem just now where the cost of actually taking food fraud and the likes in through court just to come back with a, an, a, a fine which barely dents the uh, finances of the perpetrator of the food fraud, we really do have to think in terms of how do we toughen this up. Because if we don't toughen it up, if we don't uh, provide a situation that uh, our reputation as one of the great food, pro uh, food providers of the world, the quality food providers and the industries that are followed around will diminish. And you won't have, as has been pointed out, uh, uh, salmon in France, which is uh, seen as being of the highest standard. We must show this. Which takes us on to how do we do it when, in this, uh, in this period of time, European legislation actually is so prevalent? And how do we actually take into 
uh, account the fact that the horse meat scandal was really it was something which emanated over in the continent. And we have to have, to have this partnership working. And of course, it goes through the idea of research, um, the bugs don't uh, respect borders idea and all the rest of it. We cannot act independently in this way. We have to look worldwide because the food process processing business that we have is a worldwide issue. I don't want to go through all the stuff that's been said. Everything, virtually everything that's been said here today, I can agree with. I think the principles of the bill are uh, absolutely con uh, correct. It's how do we do this in terms of not hurting the people that really are not at fault, but tracking perpetrators of fraud and ensuring that issues such as Wishaw and uh, uh, the 2013 horsemeat scandal are dealt with in an appropriate manner. Um, so can I thank you and I support the principles of the bill. Thank you. Thank you. We do still have a bit of time in hand, though, so I can give um, the remaining members in the debate seven minutes anyway each. Jane Baxter to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank the members of the Health and Sport Committee for producing this report and for the detailed way in which they have considered the proposals as set out in the Food Scotland Bill. As members in the Chamber have often recognised, we are rightly proud of the quality of Scottish produce and of the many Scottish food and drink brands that are recognised across the globe. And it isn't just high-end brands which have a global reputation. Witness Iron Brew and Tunnock's Tea Cakes taking centre stage at the Commonwealth Games opening ceremony, and you'll see that they are both national icons. But despite our international reputation for certain high-quality food and drink products, and for products which find themselves regularly in a shopping trolley of families across the UK, it's just 18 months since the horsemeat fraud filled our media and provoked a widespread concern and uncertainty about the quality and origin of the food on sale across Scotland, whether it be intended for domestic consumption or provided to children at school, patients in hospitals or residents of care homes. Those revelations focused public attention on the way our food is produced and processed as it makes its way along the chain from source to store. And it was timely indeed that the Scudamore report had been published some months previously with proposals for a Scottish food standards body to be established. That same report highlighted that food safety in Scotland seems out of step with the rest of the UK, with us seeing higher levels of E. coli at times than elsewhere. The inspection and regulation of the food industry across the board, whether it be supply, production or hospitality and catering services, is clearly much needed. And I was worried, therefore, to read of the concerns of Unison in their evidence to the committee, where they highlighted the cuts which have been made to the numbers of environmental health officers in recent years. Given the history of food safety in Scotland, it is vital the food inspection workforce remains adequately resourced and supported. Further detail on such issues and other aspects of the future work of the FSS would be welcome as the Bill progresses, and I look forward to seeing some of this explored at Stage 2 of the Bill. As has been noted, one of the key objectives of the new body is to improve the extent to which members of the public have diets which are conducive to good health. And as with some of the aspects around administration and governance of Food Standards Scotland, the detail of how the FSS will address some of the dietary challenges of Scotland needs to be explored further. And I note the Scottish Government have confirmed that this will be firmed up once the organisation is properly established. It is vital that the new powers of Food Standards Scotland to improve diet and nutrition are used and that they function well alongside existing bodies such as NHS. I look forward to seeing this and to learn more about how it will interact with existing stakeholders including local government and the third sector, in improving the well-being of Scotland's people. There are examples across Scotland of community-based food-growing projects, schools working with parents to improve knowledge of nutrition and cooking, and projects which bulk buy food and make it available to communities where the choice in local shops might be limited. I firmly believe that such initiatives have a big role to play in changing behaviours and raising awareness, and hope that this will be recognised as we move forward because we remain a nation which has worryingly high levels of obesity amongst men, women and children. The Scottish Health Service's own data indicates that in 2012, as many as one in six children were at risk of obesity, 
Colleagues, we literally are what we eat. But although this is perhaps an irrefut irrefutable fact, it's not enough in itself to influence behaviours and attitudes to food. And I say this as a grandma who has been known to treat the family to a fast food feast. Consider my use of the word treat. It says something about our attitude to food. And I confess my grandchildren would probably choose a fast food option over grandma's home cooking any day. But the health implications of the food we eat are huge and can directly impact on day-to-day -day quality of life as well as long-term well-being. At the time of the horse meat fraud last year, there was a renewed focus on how people can access good quality, affordable, fresh food. For many people, there is simply not the money in their pocket nor the time in their day to pop along to their local organic market, even if such a thing were to exist in their area. And many people do not have the skills or equipment to produce a nutritious home-cooked meal. None of these are circumstances over which people might have much control, so there needs to be realistic discussions about how people access food in their local communities and what choices are available. And we need to consider the quality of food when the consumer may be vulnerable and yet have little choice available. Members will recall there was widespread concern about the content of meals in schools and hospitals and care homes, as well as the meat being sold in supermarkets up and down the country. That episode flagged up a clear breach of trust which is why the food labelling provisions of the bill are so important. We must also be able to trace food back through the chain to see the production stage to the slaughterhouses and suppliers at the beginning of the process. Many of the problems last year were traced to international suppliers. There was a good response to that scandal, but I'm keen to see clear measures of how we can prevent such instances from ever occurring again. While there were some reservations from those who have given evidence, on the whole, there has been clear support for the establishment of a separate food standards body, and I'm happy to lend my support to that today. However, as others have noted, we must ensure that cross-border regulations work well and that Scottish producers are not faced with additional labelling burdens or different requirements if selling to markets in the rest of the UK. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I call Stuart Stevenson, could I ask that all members who have previously requested to speak in the debate ensure that the request to speak buttons are pressed. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Roderick Campbell. It's a very great privilege to represent uh, the people of the North East of Scotland and of course it allows me to indulge my uh, palate and pamper my digestion. Um, as I look across my constituency, I can be eating smoked salmon from Port Soy, which has been smoked using whisky barrels redundant from the local whisky industry with a variety of flavours. Isn't that wonderful? I can go uh, to my supermarket and buy a ready meal uh, in every supermarket in these islands, which has been produced in Fraserburgh to high standards. I can eat haddocks um, that have come from Peterhead. And of course, I can eat excellent beef, lamb and other meats. And increasingly, the greengrocer has been supplanted by the butcher in butchers across my constituency. But perhaps the one which I particularly enjoy is to go to Fight Hills and buy, for a pound, the Cullen Skink Scotch Pie, which, popped in the microwave or under the grill or in the oven, is the most delicious Scotch pie you will ever have in your life. And if, if perchance, they are shut, then I can go to the chip shop where Billy Gatt serves excellent fish and chips, and I know it's excellent because he also has the fishing boat that provides the fish. So in the northeast of Scotland, we can do extremely well. I will. I, I, I thank the member for, for giving away. I, I know we do have some time in hand, presiding officer, so I hope you don't mind me making this intervention, but I'm just wondering if the member ever brings some of this produce through to the Scottish Parliament from time to time. Stuart Stevenson. I'll take the orders later. Downies of White Hills will be delighted. I, I will say to you, you can go online and they will send it to you. Uh, and I genuinely, genuinely encourage you to do that. It is superb. And tonight's tea uh, has a boiled egg from a chicken uh, that is kept in a garden in Edinburgh. A friend gave me it two nights ago. Now, not all uh, outcomes of consuming our excellent Scottish produce are entirely predictable. I once, as a, a very young lad, uh, was so attracted to the Victoria plums growing in our garden uh, that the doctor had to be called because I had turned a rather delicate shade of purple. 
and that was uh, found to be the cause. Uh, Richard Simpson talked about the demise of porridge. Well, it's revived. Um, I was brought up in Cooper and Fife, and of course, Scots porridge oats were produced just on the doorstep of Cooper. They now produce excellent microwave porridge, two minutes in the microwave. It's got a little bit of soya in it to stop it boiling over, and it's well worth, and there are other suppliers. I don't just focus on that. I hope I've not called the feet uh, from my colleague who represents uh, uh, North East Fife. But porridge is still there, and it's excellent. I have it every single day in my life often with uh, fruit, particularly Scottish berries. Now, we talked about, you know, how difficult is it to do cooking? Well, I was in the Boy Scouts, I won't be alone in that, and I started my cooking career in the Boy Scouts without a single implement of any kind. I threw an onion into the fire. And you waited until it was really charred, then you fished it out, peeled all the bunt bits off, and you had a sort of semi-cooked onion that you could chew on. And that was really very good for you, if not very good for your love life, but there we are. And we moved on to wrapping potatoes in tin foil and throwing them in the fire. And you could make baked potatoes without any instruments. Now, I can see the looks of horror round the chamber, but, but, but seriously, colleagues, seriously, colleagues, let's show our youngsters that you can actually make a start a start in the business of cooking from the simplest of sources using what is to hand. So it sounds funny, but it actually got me into the idea that you could do cooking. And I hope the FSS uh, will do a, 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 a little uh, bit about that. So Jane Baxter, you don't necessarily need uh, to have any equipment. Now, let's just have a wee uh, think about some of the things that happen in our communities, particularly in rural areas. Um, there are a lot of homemade bits of uh, produce, jams, scones, there are coffee mornings, there are uh, soup and sweets are a particular feature of life in the northeast. Mm -hmm. And it's very important that when we set up a regulatory regime, we don't end up in a position where it's difficult for that kind of voluntary sale of food products becomes difficult. Um, the, 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 the vote in the recent election and all elections where I go is the WRI Hall at Hilton in the middle of nowhere, and they have wonderful strawberry teas, and et cetera, et cetera. So let's be careful uh, that we don't do anything that might uh, compromise that. Now, we've made quite a lot of references to quality of Scottish product. And I think sometimes there are unintended side effects uh, that come uh, from certain actions. And I refer particularly to the Immature Spirits Act of 1915, which was brought forward at the behest of Lloyd George to restrict the supply of spirits by meaning that it had to be kept in bond for three years so that the military towns and factories had less spirits available to sobriety would rule, productivity would rise. Well, that was all neither here nor there. The reality is what it did was it eliminated the cheap rock gut whiskey from the offering. And it laid the foundations for the export industry that is an important part of our economy to this day. And indeed, some brands of whiskey still have on them bottled under British government supervision. And that all stems from the 1915 Immature Spirits Act. So although it drove the cost of whiskey up and created a certain set of problems, it ended up creating an industry with a worldwide reputation, which, as my intervention on Bob Doris illustrated, um, is actually much copied, and we need to protect that uh, very, very hard indeed. Claire Baker, I, I think, in particular, raised uh, the issue. Now, the new uh, FSS, Food Standards Scotland, um, I suggest it's got one thing I'm not sure I see clearly articulated in the work on the subject so far. And that is, how is it going to respond to innovation in the food sector? Because we won't stand still on this. If we don't move forward and continue to innovate, others will outcompete us. So I think the FSS has to have more than simply a duty uh, to, to, to regulate. It also has to have an element of a duty to help and assist. In other words, like SEPA now does, it can't just knock on your door and tell you you've got a problem. It's got to be working with people in the industry to help them develop a solution to the problem. And taking that solution away 
and sharing it with others and helping others. So I think that's maybe one uh, little thing uh, that the Minister and others who are in, involved in this might, uh, might care to think about. I must say, I envy the Minister because I have a suspicion he's going to, like me, find himself uh, visiting uh, food producers, perhaps, in the course of this. Well, maybe he's done all that already. When I was a Minister, I got taken to um, a community garden in Money Mayo, again in my colleague's uh, constituency, and presented with a basket of organic fresh vegetables. Harvested that very day, and believe me, the taste of that, when I took it on, my wife said, where did you get this? Can you get some more? I regret, of course, that MSPs, as is usual, uh, are not allowed to be appointed to the board of this new body, because I just foresee that the board will be a position that is greatly sought because they will be so close to our wonderful uh, food, food that we produce in Scotland. Presiding officer, like others, I'm happy to see this bill brought to Parliament. I look forward to the debate here on in and I will be supporting it every inch and every bite of the way. Presiding officer. Many thanks. I now call Roderick Campbell to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's always a difficult job to follow Mr Stevenson, uh, particularly today, but he's uh, expanded my knowledge uh, of a piece of legislation I hitherto had no knowledge of at all, the Immature Spirits Act 1915, and I shall remember that for some time. But as a non-member of the committee, I'd like to thank the committee, however, for their sterling work on this bill. And as has already been mentioned today, Scotland has a worldwide reputation for being the home of good food. Our food suppliers proudly trade in Scotland's name in produce as diverse as meat and potatoes to desserts and other forms of confectionery. Like Stuart Stevenson, I represent a part of Scotland in which the food industry is vital. North East Fife, as uh, Mr Stevenson has already mentioned, and indeed I can assure Richard uh, Simpson that the porridge oats industry is alive and kicking in uh, my part of the world. But the food industry is both uh, vital to the local and indeed the Scottish national economy. It's therefore imperative that the standard and safety of the produce is second to none. Scotland's reputation in international food markets has suffered in the past due to events including the BSE crisis, the foot and mouth disease and the most recent horse meat scandal. And it should be remembered, of course, that in none of the products sampled by the Food Standards Agency on a UK-wide basis were any traces of horse meat in any produce manufactured in Scotland established. All 47 products found to be containing horse meat were from other parts of the United Kingdom. Nevertheless, we cannot be complacent when it comes to food standards in Scotland and we must learn from past mistakes. But I applaud the Scottish Government's decision to accept the recommendations from the reporting groups led by Professor Jim Scudamore and Ray Jones, respectively, which we have heard referred to earlier on. And I agree with the conclusion reached by the Health and Sport Committee in its Stage 1 report that the changes made in the UK have made it necessary for there to be a new food body in Scotland. The machinery of government changes made by the UK Government in 2010 that affected the, the Food Standards Agency were, of course, criticised by Professor Scudamore in his earlier work. Uh, and uh, as far as I'm aware, that there is a continuing disagreement down south uh, between the FSA, uh, who are continuing to demand control be given back to it over authenticity and labelling policy and uh, other agencies of the UK Government. The, the, the policy, of course, here was that there was already a devolved matter, but as Professor Scudamore ha had earlier warned, he, the consequences of the machinery of government changes were uh, detrimental, uh, and I'm sure that the Scottish approach that we've adopted is the correct one. Um, I hope, however, notwithstanding that, that a suitable way forward is found in England following the publication of the uh, Elliott Review, or to give it its full title, uh, the Elliott Review into the Integrity and Assurance of Food Supply Networks, a National Food Crime Prevention Framework. There you are. But uh, one of the things that I'm concerned about is that uh, there will be no negative knock-on impact in Scotland as a result of a continuing wrangling taking place between DEFRA and the FSA. I noted with interest, moving on, that the majority of the respondents to the Scottish Government's own consultation on a new food body in Scotland were in favour of extending the remit of the new body at some stage, and that these included all local authorities that responded. There appears to be a broad agreement that any extension of the remit should be done so on the basis that it provides, quote, improved strategic leadership and better coordination of multi-agency service delivery. Well, that's an admirable aim. 
Presiding officer, issues relating to food contamination, safety and standards have been well rehearsed in the debate today, and many of the respondents to the Scottish Government's consultation on creating the new food body recommended that the new food authority should have scope over all aspects of food, quote, from farm to fork. Localising this work as far as possible would be very helpful. To that end, I share the sentiment expressed in their response by Fife Council uh, when they stated, Fife Council believes the existing partnership between local authorities and FSA works well, and this successful partnership approach in Scotland is the building block for a new body. I agree with that aim. As to enforcement, I welcome the enforcement provisions set out in the Bill, particularly the power to seize and detain food which does not comply with food information law, as is currently the position in relation to unsafe food. It's quite clear that knowing that the food we're eating is safe is something that we perhaps all take for granted. We assume that the food in its packaging and on our plates have come from reputable, reliable sources and will cause us no ill harm. But as the Minister has already mentioned in his opening remarks, for 50 people a year in Scotland, foodborne disease proves fatal, and for 2,000 people each year, hospital treatment will be needed. Richard Simpson's already referred to the, the, the historic problem of E. coli at uh, Wishaw, and we obviously don't want to go down that route again. But it's not only in terms of safety that the new body will be charged with overseeing. In addition, it will be charged with improving diet and nutrition, or as has been mentioned already, to improve the extent to which members of the public have diets which are conducive to good health. As many will recall, we have previously discussed the Fife diet in this chamber, and I make no apology for drawing the chamber's attention once again to it. Since October 2007, the Fife diet campaign has challenged people in Fife to eat locally sourced produce. The initiative has continued to grow and has encouraged people from further afield to try a locally sourced diet. One of the benefits of this is knowing exactly where the food you're eating has come from, tying in with the from farm to fork ethos that I previously mentioned. This means people will know the food they're eating, which will generally be seasonable, will be of good quality and, most important of all, safe to consume. The long-term effect of the diet will, I hope, be significant. And while I'm aware that some stakeholders believe that the new body now being created could go further in supporting the growth, the growth of the food and drink industry, in my view, the agency will have achieved a lot if it can help improve Scotland's diet, with undoubted benefits not only to the health service but to individuals concerned. It also seems to me that uh, in the bill, in the objective 2C, is the, is the clause to protect the other interests of consumers in relation to food. That seems to me quite wind-raging, and it seems to me gives every opportunity for the new agency to expand its role in the period to come. In my view, Presiding Officer, this is an important bill, and I wish the new agency when it's established well. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I now call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Gil Patterson. Thank you very much, President Officer. I have a number of perspectives on this debate. As a co-convener of the cross-party group on food in the last parliament, as minister with the responsibility for the Food Standards Agency in Scotland in the term before that, and as one of those who campaigned successfully for FSA Scotland to be based in Aberdeen back in 1999. And I believe the existing agency has been a success from all of those perspectives. It has been engaged with Parliament and other partners. It has been responsive to government and to public policy. And it has been an exemplar, which I think makes the case for locating central government agencies in cities and regions of Scotland out with the central belt. The Food Standards Agency was set up by the incoming Labour government of 1997 at much the same time as it legislated for the Scottish Parliament. It is no coincidence that the inspiration to set up the FSA came from two leading uh, academic experts in Aberdeen, uh, microbiologist Professor Hugh Pennington, who gave evidence to the committee's inquiry this time round, and Professor Philip James, the then director of the Rowett Research Institute. Hugh Pennington, of course, led the inquiry into the E. coli outbreak in Wishaw in 1996, which has been referred to by a number of members, and his report recommended the creation of a new food standards agency. And Philip James had a report on how to do that on ministers' desks within days of the 1997 election. And it was that report which was then implemented to establish the FSA over the following couple of years. Of course. Stuart Stevenson. Um, it's kind of just an observation about uh, the 
fall out from the E. coli. That uh, it required butchers to raise the standard separate cold meat from, from, from cook, uncooked meat from cooked meat. But curiously, it seems to have had the result across Scotland that while there are fewer butchers, these butchers, by investing and innovating, are now much safer and competing successfully with supermarkets. So sometimes if a good central agency does its job well, it actually helps industry in a way that's not always foreseen, and that's an example. Lewis MacDonald, and I can give you the time back. I'm, I'm grateful to Mr Stevenson for that point, and he's absolutely right. And I think uh, we heard earlier criticism of enforcement in relation to the fish processing industry. The same applies, that effective enforcement of the right regulations is actually good for the industry uh, as well as uh, good for the consumer. And I think he is right to make that point at this stage. The timetable of the establishment of the FSA meant that it was being set up in Scotland as one of the first actions of the new uh, devolved government in 1999. And the intention to locate FSA Scotland in Aberdeen was announced by the Scottish Executive in October 1999, and the present headquarters at St Magnus House was opened in April 2000. Now, Professor James and Professor Pennington were only the best known of a very substantial scientific research community in Aberdeen, which is what made the city the obvious choice of location for the agency and which continues to support the work of the FSA in Scotland to this day. And it is striking, on the one hand, how the institutional landscape of that research community has changed in the period of revolution, but even more strikingly, how the scientific excellence which supports it remains of the highest order. So, for example, the Rowett Research Institute is now part of the University uh, of Aberdeen, but it continues to be a world leader in the science of nutrition and health. That was important in 1999. It is even more important today, given that the Bill proposes to strengthen the remit of Food Standards Scotland uh, in relation to dietary health. The Marine Lab, the Marine Laboratory in Aberdeen is now part of Marine Scotland. It too continues to provide best-in-class expertise in a whole range of areas, such as safe consumption of shellfish. The former Macau Macaulay Land Use Research Institute is now part of the James Hutton Institute. The former Scottish Agricultural College is now part of Scotland's Rural College. But again, both of those remain important partners for the FSA today and for the F FSS in future. And that critical mass of scientific expertise is not gathered in and around Aberdeen by accident. The North East region has, as we have heard, an exceptional concentration of both primary food producers and food processing industries, and that is ultimately what sustains Aberdeen as a centre both of knowledge and of regulation. And geography has also helped FSA Scotland to make a success of its Aberdeen base beyond the immediate city region. Ease of access to ministers and other stakeholders, both in Edinburgh and in London, has been important and will continue to be so. And whatever the institutional framework of the or the policy priorities of the respective governments, close partnerships and Scottish access to research excellence and food advisory bodies across the UK will continue to be vital to the effectiveness of FSS. And another benefit which uh, has also been alluded to in part has been that food standards practitioners from other parts of Britain have come to Aberdeen and to Scotland to learn from the work done here. That's not only good for uh, those other regulators, as Bob Dodd said, it's also a source of informal influence beyond Scotland, which is very much in Scotland's interest. And I hope it is something which ministers will also seek to maintain going forward uh, as the memorandum of understanding between FSA and FSS is put in place. Quick and frequent transport links between Aberdeen and the Northern Isles have also been very important to the success of the agency. FSA Scotland has had very high levels of engagement with food producers and processors in both Shetland and Orkney to benefit both of the agency and of those island communities. And as a central government agency located out with the central belt, FSA Scotland has from the very beginning had an outward looking approach to engaging with stakeholders across the Highlands and Islands and throughout the whole of Scotland. There is no culture of staying warm in an office close to the centres of power instead of getting out and engaging with the real world. FSA staff have always seen the whole of Scotland as their home patch and I am confident that culture will continue in a new agency based in Aberdeen. And many of those strengths which FSS will inherit from FSA Scotland can be built on in the period ahead. The Rowett, for instance, provides the scientific basis for the Food and Health Innovation Service with funding from Scottish Enterprise, but bringing together partners from across the UK. For example, Marks and Spencer's, their fuller, longer uh, range of foods, uh, which is available in stores throughout 
uh, United Kingdom, was developed with, with the support, active support and advice of the Rowett Institute. Just one example of the excellent work which is done by uh, FSA's partners in Aberdeen, which will continue to be available to the new FSS. And FSS will also want to maintain its strong partnerships with the local authorities in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, as well as with the food sector. I would commend local councils for enforcing food safety regulations in the interests of consumers. And I would support what both Claire Baker and Annette Milne had to say about the importance of properly resourcing that regulatory activity at all levels. So I hope today the Minister will reaffirm the Government's commitment to meeting that resourcing challenge, its support for continuing partnerships both in Scotland and beyond Scotland, and its commitment to continue to deliver Scotland's food standards from a new headquarters in Aberdeen. With those commitments, I believe the Bill will go forward with support from across this chamber. Many thanks. And just before I call Gil Patterson, who is our final open debate speaker, could I remind Parliament that members who have participated in debates are expected to be in the Chamber for closing speeches. Gil Patterson. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to make a contribution to this debate this afternoon. Of course, some of the points I intend to raise have already been outlined by other speakers, so please bear with me. I, but I think some of the items are worth uh, stating. Firstly, uh, I'd like to praise those involved in the food in industry in Scotland and the positive effects they bring for Scotland and our economy. Across the, the globe, their products are known, respected, trusted and enjoyed, which bring great advantage to the country's economy and, of course, the industry itself. Uh, I believe that Scotland's platform on the world stage in 2014 through the Commonwealth Games, the Ryder Cup, the homecoming and even the referendum will bring greater interest in our products. To give the industry the protection and security we need to ensure that there is clear structures in place to ensure that standards remain as high as possible. That is why I am pleased that the Bill sets out the establishment of a single body, Food Standards Scotland, which, in which it has a clear responsibility on all aspects of food safety and standards to gain trust and confidence with not only the food industry but also the consumers. I welcome the fact that the new body will be independent, evidence-based, transparent and accountable to this Parliament. There have been too many incidents over the last few years where trust has broken down between governments, the food industry and the ordinary people. All of us in this chamber will remember the mad cow disease epid epidemic during the 1990s, where British beef, beef, including our own Scotch beef, was banned from a number of countries around the world. The horsemeat scandal was one such incident recently, where trust in our food pro produce was lost and had a detrimental impact on our economy. But I, I am relieved that the long-term trust not, uh, was not damaged and that we have came out of this uh, much stronger. I am fairly sure that a single body agency in charge of food safety and standards could have prevented these examples from happening and the changes carried out since then must continue to develop and adapt to new environmental conditions to ensure that we can combat any future issues. I believe a standards, a, a Food Standards Scotland, through measures contained in this bill, have been given the appropriate enforcement powers to follow this through and, and maintain the trust of the producers and the consumers alike. There is no point having a weak organisation when dealing with such a vital component of day-to-day -day life. The, the people deserve nothing less. The creation of appropriate non-criminal enforcement sanctions will go some way in this regard, as will the measures allowing officers to seize and destroy foods that do not meet food standards or labelling rules. Consumers will be con uh, con uh, comforted in knowing that produce that they have purchased will contain exactly what is outlined on the label and nothing else. This is a very important point to emphasise when building trust. As a member of the Health and Sports Committee, one of the aspects of the bill 
that draws my particular attention in the, is the measure relating to nutritious diet for people in Scotland and how that this is paramount to ensuring that our people live healthily and longer. N knowing what is contained within uh, produce will help families uh, purchase goods that, of, uh, that are of nutri nutritional value, which will have a positive impact on their diets and the general population. We have discussed at great length, not only in the Health and Sports Committee, but also in this chamber, the importance of tackling obesity in the country and the health problems associated with it. And I'm pleased that the Scottish Government has taken this matter very seriously. Scotland's not alone in experience obesity, crisis, the, the obesity crisis, and we must learn from other countries. But there must also be a Scottish dimension to any solution, what is an ever-increasing problem, not only in health of our people, but also the impact that it has on our health service uh, in the long run. C can I say a, a word to my, my good friend Chris Nallard, who can I said that he may not be particularly equipped at this particular time to address matters of obesity. Uh, my guidance to, to, to Chris Nallard would be that someone with a few pounds round their middle at the present time might be the very person to engage in that matter with some people who suffer from not being able to control what they eat. And it's, you know, it's like all addictions. And so therefore, someone that's had an experience of it and maybe carrying some of it as, a, in my book, the very, very best person to do that. And, and, and I can, yes, by all means. Stuart Stevenson. Um, just on a related matter, with the increase in the consumption of meals that people microwave and the different way that a microwave cooks things, in other words, from the middle outwards, um, I wonder if uh, some of the health issues arise from the fact that because the outside of a microwave meal may not be heated enough if it's done properly, some of the bacterial load is not eliminated by the cooking process. And I just wonder if there's a wide range of things that, in the change of our cooking habits that we need to look at to protect the health, not simply by overconsumption, but actually by the way we cook, prepare and eat things as well. Gil Patterson. Well, you make a good point because I think in this modern life, uh, not only are people so, you know, moving so fast and maybe don't perhaps take enough time to prepare their food, uh, but there's another, there's another thing that I've learned that some families have never had the experience of engagement and been taught how to, how to cook a meal. Uh, and I think that's a very, very serious issue uh, for all of us. But uh, let me finish my, 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 my little chat to my good friend, uh, you're talking from someone that suffer, suffers from an addiction and that sweet things in iron brew. I just can't give it up. So I'm the wrong person to talk to somebody about doing that uh, or to talk about weight because I, I'm okay that way. But to try and uh, control what I eat uh, in terms of sweets and, and iron brew is a hard job. Uh, we have discussed at great length, not only in the Health and Sports Committee, also in the Chamber, uh, that uh, very thing. Uh, so I, I hope that uh, we do learn from it and we can make uh, an improvements to it. It has been estimated that a total cost of uh, obesity in the Scottish society is to, in 2007-2008 was in excess of £450 million and the public cost is expected to dram dramatically increase to £3 billion by 2030. These are scary, scary figures for the, for the health service. This is a problem of a truly serious nature and it all must be done, both at government level and personal level, to tackle it. One area which concerns, uh, concerns uh, in particular with the uh, unhealthy diet is the, the particular impact on uh, the low-income uh, people in our country. Could I ask you to begin to draw to a close, please? Uh, surely. Th thanks very much and thanks for being so patient with me. Um, I, I think I should just finish by uh, commending to the Chamber uh, this bill and hope that it passes through uh, unanimously tonight. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the closing speeches and I call on Jackson Carlaw. I can give you up to seven minutes. Uh, presiding officer, thank you. Well, after three frenetic weeks bashing round Scotland, debating the great issue of our constitutional future, back we come to Holyrood keen to involve ourselves in the business of Scotland and what more thrilling prospect could there have been 
for the first piece of primary legislation that we would discuss than the Food Scotland Bill. And it was, of course, the Minister's uh, mission this afternoon to make this as thrilling and as exciting uh, an opportunity for discussion as he could. A responsibility he studiously sought to avoid, I thought, this afternoon, as the words worthy, consensual and non-controversial fought each other into an early grave. And I make no criticism of him for that, because Scottish Conservatives support the principles of this bill because the content of it and the various aspects of it that members have referred to throughout the debate this afternoon are indeed uh, important. And there are a number of points that rose that uh, attracted my interest during the course of the afternoon to which I'd like to refer. There was almost the tongue twister that the minister involved himself in at some length of the horse meat labelling food fraud scandal, which I waited for him to trip up on from time to time, which, of course, he made a point about. I just want to say, first of all, that, um, you know, it was the fraud relating to horse meat that was the problem. Uh, we are quite you know, precious in this country about a number of things. And, uh, you know, in other parts of the world, people eat horses quite freely. In fact, I saw in the papers this week that we're all being encouraged to eat Dartmoor ponies as being the only way to make the, the, the species sustainable. Um, but the minister said that the labelling would prevent the fraud. And I wasn't quite sure how that would necessarily come about. I mean, obviously, the key thing will always be the testing of product to ensure that what we are getting is what it says inside it. And that is the part of that that, that is particularly important. Um, I was uh, grateful to Duncan McNeil, who I think set out the work of the committee in this respect, which pr uh, demonstrated that he felt the consultation had been wide. Well, can I maybe wait till I get, because your interventions have been about half an hour in each occasion, Mr. <laughs> Stevenson. Um, uh, your predecessor and the chair presiding officer, of course, referred to Mr. Uh, McNeil's punnet of um, puns, and we'd had meat in the sandwich, we'd had food for thought, and at one point, I have to say to Mr. McNeil, he was getting quite confused between his FSSs, his FSAs, his SFSs, and potentially his SFAs, I think we were almost getting round to. Um, but I thought that he made important points about um, the whole question of board accountability and about the composition of the board, which I think the Minister already recognises. I want to actually focus a little bit on the area that Richard Simpson touched on, because I think that the whole question of diet is undoubtedly one of the most important. When this Parliament first met in 1999, frankly, the issues of dementia and obesity were rarely, if ever, discussed. They are health challenges that have emerged, which are actually two colossal pillars of the uh, health challenge that the NHS now has ahead of it, that have emerged essentially during the lifetime of this parliament. And the whole question of obesity, the type 2 uh, diabetes, the 250,000 people, the estimated cost of £3 billion a year by 2030, is one of the great challenges. And I do want to concentrate on diet because Mr Simpson and Mr Stevenson touched on porridge. And, you know, porridge is one of those uh, foodstuffs that has been corrupted. Because if you buy instant porridge, as so many people do, and on the supermarket shelves you will see dozens and dozens of variety, they are absolutely thick with sugar substitute. And if you look compared to the natural product, you will find something like 26 to 45 grams of sugar in each portion that is served. And it is this concentration of sugar that I think we need to spend a lot more time analysing and drawing attention to, because our whole focus on diet has been concerned with low-fat diet, without recognising that whether it be instant porridge or whether it be low-fat yoghurts, they are absolutely rich in sugar substitute. I have to tell you, I looked around, I know you should do your own porridge and everybody who's got time to do so. I had to look very hard to find an instant porridge that actually doesn't have a lot of sugar content in it. And I recommend it be stuffed up with blueberries and raspberries and you'll all be very much better off as a result. Uh, but both Jane Baxter and Ailey McLeod also made reference to the whole issue of diet as we move forward and the importance of it. But what I do want to say is it's our responsibility to inform. We must not allow it to become our responsibility for individuals themselves and the diet that they consume. Everybody has to remember that they have a responsibility themselves to the diet that they have. If we simply allow it to become a transferable responsibility to government, I think that we do the public a disservice.
Uh, now Christian Allard, I thought, made a very fine contribution. It came from, of course, the 30 years of experience that he has had in the food industry, and I think he made particular points about food labeling. And I think he also, I think, made an important point as a businessman from the food industry in saying that the good intentions of politicians sometimes don't always uh, take into account the practical realities of having to deal with all the food labeling uh, responsibilities that then are placed upon retailers, and we should be mindful of that. He referred to his visit, I think it was a private one, to Joseph Robertson Limited. I've seen the photograph in the report, and Aileen McLeod, Duncan McNeil, Richard Simpson and Richard Lyle, who's not with us, all look very fetching in their Wellington boots, plastic hats and coats. And you can see why Richard Lyle isn't here, actually, having seen his photograph in that. Bob Doris quoted the SNP's new favourite retailer, Tesco, and that was interesting to hear. Malcolm Chisholm drew attention to important matters around future research. And Stuart Stevenson, um, I thought, also made it important. He talked about soup and sweet, which I hope isn't the Aberdeen way of saying you'll have had your main course. But... Um, he did talk about regulation does not become an unintended food hazard, and I think that is an important consideration as well. We don't want to see that come about. Um, we've got to twin the whole issue of diet, of the, uh, food response, the food agenda that we are addressing here today, uh, with the twin of exercise, which of course is a, an unrelated, a related but indirectly so, um, aspect of the whole question of ensuring that people going forward are healthy. Uh, I also pay tribute to Colin Keir, Roderick Campbell, Claire Baker, Lewis MacDonald and Gil Patterson who also made contributions to this afternoon's debate. I think that at stage two there are issues we would like to see addressed. We are concerned slightly about the uh, notice to detain food that may contribute food information. We want to be sure that there is a right of appeal because when it's down to whether or not the labelling has been uh, complied with regulation. That could be quite subjective and we could see a, an element of interference and waste there. And also just to ensure that the fixed penalties don't become something that people absorb as a cost uh, deliberately to try and frustrate the legislation. But we're happy to support the first reading of the bill this afternoon. Many thanks. And I now call in Rhoda Grant. Nine minutes, please. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I join with other members um, and thank witnesses, those who uh, facilitated the committee visits to Aberdeen and those who submitted evidence and indeed the clerks and committee staff who coordinated all that work. So I just want to add our thanks to, to them in particular. We're supportive of the general principles of the bill and recognise the need for it. Uh, we need robust, a robust regulatory regime that protects our consumers. Um, high standards standards not only protect consumers but promote um, our producers and indeed our products, a point very clearly made by Claire Baker. We shouldn't have been surprised that members took the opportunity to talk about their favourite brands and indeed some of our iconic brands, Scottish Salmon, Johnny Walker's Whiskey, Jane Baxter mentioned Iron Brew and Tunnock's Tea Cakes and uh, Stuart Stevenson, Cullen Skink and a Scotch Pie, which was a new one on me. Um, can I say that maybe that tells you more about the Scottish diet than anything else, but maybe quoting the old adage, a little of what you fancy does you good, means that if you eat that in moderation, um, any pleasure you get might offset the detriment if you're very careful. Um, but other than that, I think the debate has been a serious debate. Um, looking at um, the public health role is one of them, and a lot of uh, the speakers have talked about the Scottish diet and indeed health and obesity uh, in our nation and how we need to interact, at, interact with that and have welcomed that the Food Standards Scotland may have a health prevention role um, which would have to be carried out in, along with the, other, the others involved in this uh, health service and local government and the need to make sure, uh, as Jane Baxter, Baxter said, that this is coordinated and doesn't uh, duplicate those efforts. But given the enormity of the problem we face, uh, it's very important that Food Standards Scotland have a role there too. Uh, Richard Simpson talked at some length about um, our, our health issues regarding obesity, regarding, regarding diet and portion size, but also talked about things like the Trans Fat Members Bill he had promoted in the Parliament and what a difference that would have made actually in, in our diet because we know 
that cheap food tends to be high in fat, tends to be high in sugar, because that improves the taste, um, but it can also be hugely harmful to health. And I think it was Jackson Carlow also pointed out that you know, food that is sometimes termed as healthy, low fat, is actually really high in sugar, and we need to be very careful um, that that doesn't have a health consequence when people are thinking that they're making the right food choices, but actually are, are, are make, doing more harm in their diet than they would have hoped to do. Malcolm Chisholm talked about food poverty, and I think that is really important. And again, it emphasises the need for local authorities to work with Food St Standards Scotland and also uh, health boards to make sure that people actually are able to access, those living in poverty, able to access good healthy food. Because as I said earlier, cheap food tends to be the most unhealthy. And on that topic, Jane Baxter talked about a community food initiatives and part of the committee's Aberdeen visit was a visit to a, the community food initiative North East and saw some of the work that they were doing in trying to provide healthy food, promote healthy food choices, but also um, operated as a food bank as well. And I think it was good that the committee did go to, the, to Aberdeen in the North East for all the reasons that Lewis MacDonald talked about it being a centre of excellence. Um, for food, food, food production and indeed food safety and, and research. So I think it was very useful and we met some of the organisations he, he spoke about at some length in his speech and they made a, a great contribution to the committee's de uh, deliberations on a food standard, the Food Standards Bill. One of the issues that came up, maybe not so much in debate as it might have done, was the, the funding of the agency. And the net talked about uh, negotiations ongoing between the Food Standards Agency UK and Food Standards Scotland. And hopefully that those will be resolved to bring a satisfactory settlement and finance um, to Food Standards Scotland, which I think would be uh, very welcomed by everybody in the chamber. And if um, there they, they have the existing finance that they currently enjoy, they will be able to continue in the role that they have. But are they to take on new roles such as public health? Um, they need to look at more funding. So we need uh, to make sure that that funding is in place. The Scottish Government has acknowledged that they would need to provide more funding, but there's no real assurances on that. So we need to get those assurances to make sure that any extension to those responsibilities are fully funded so that they and carry them out and I think Malcolm Chisholm also made that point in his speech and others also talked about um, funding with regard to local authorities I think um, it was Claire Baker who mentioned that about the role of consumer protection um, and food safety and that falls on local government and we see local government budgets being tightened so it's maybe not enough just to look at the funding of Food Standards Scotland. We also need to look at the funding of the other organisations that have really have a lead role in protecting consumers um, and indeed public, public health and safety. People like meat inspectors who, who were mentioned in debate who provide a really good job but are, are very thinly spread. And, you know, if we're going to be serious about this, uh, we must make sure that funding goes to them as well as Food Standards Scotland and, indeed, that they all work together to bring good outcomes um, to consumers. There was a lot of talk about um, labelling and the need for robust labelling um, because it's very easy, as we saw with the horse meat um, scandal, to put um, a different, cheaper product in, into food in order to provide profits for those who, who produce that food. Uh, Roderick Campbell mentioned that None of that food was indeed um, sourced back to Scotland. And maybe that is because we already enjoy a good regulatory regime um, with regard to labelling that stopped that happening. But I don't think we can afford um, to be complacent. And indeed, on our visit to Aberdeen, we visited a uh, Joseph... Robertson Aberdeen Limited and saw how their food labelling worked and indeed the efforts they went into ensuring food security in, in that, you know, if there was products that could have been um, caused an allergic reaction to anybody, they were 
used during, towards the end of the week when other food had already been produced. So there was a huge amount of effort and precision and indeed programming to make sure that the labelling was correct, that the food was secure and what it said on the tin was actually what was there. So that was very, very useful. But we also understand that um, producers are concerned about food labelling and the need for a compatible regime throughout the the UK. So I think it's very good that there is a memorandum of understanding looking at those issues, um, which I think will bring the protection we all want, but also um, the safeguards that the industry wants um, to make sure that we can be proud of our products. There was some discussion about um, the fixed penalty notice, and I think fi having fixed penalties means that lesser infringements can be dealt with quickly and more easily and it means that the process is streamlined, maybe freeing up inspectors and the like to go on to the more uh, difficult businesses. But I also welcome that we're looking at a, um, a, an appeals process because I think it's very important that people have the right of appeal if there's a mistake made and that puts checks and balances into the system. So we would welcome seeing what that will look like as the bill progresses um, through the Parliament. There was also a um, discussion on the board, and there was some concern in, during the committee's del deliberations on this. Um, but we have, as Duncan McNeill mentioned in his a speech uh, received reassurances from the Scottish Government that the board will be of a size that will allow it to do its job. And we have to be very careful that the focus of the board is actually consumer protection and, maybe, and not industry-led. I think there's a lot of concerns about that. That doesn't mean that you can't have an employee director, as Claire Baker pointed out. And I think that makes a huge difference. And indeed, I think the Government um, welcomed the, the recommendation of the Mayor Commission um, on, on this, and I, I think it would be a welcome uh, step forward if this new body was actually one of the first to implement that recommendation. And I think everyone could get behind that. I think it's very important to have could employees Could you draw to a close, involved. please? Um, sorry, presiding officer, I thought I had loads more time, but as, as happens, it runs away. Can I just say that partnership working will be at the very forefront of how Food Standards Scotland operate, and I think that we need to emphasise that while agreeing to support the bill and the general principles of the bill. Many thanks. I now call on Michael Matheson to wind up the debate. Minister, you have until five o'clock, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I begin by thanking everyone for their contribution during the course of this debate? And I think there have been a range of very good points uh, raised. And I do welcome the fact that there is broad cross-party support for the uh, Food Standards Scotland uh, uh, being established and for this piece of uh, legislation. I do think that uh, Duncan McNeill and his own uh, contribution set out uh, in a very fair way uh, the, the broad areas uh, that this uh, legislation will, be, be, will provide for. Uh, and he also rightly highlighted the various views that there are around the creation of uh, Food Standards Scotland. I recognise that not everyone in the sector uh, believes it is the right thing to do for their own particular purpose, although the vast majority believe it is the right thing to do. Uh, but as I'm sure all in the Chamber recognise, uh, we've arrived at this particular point not because of a failing in the part of the FSC, but because of changes that have taken place elsewhere and the expert group, not just Professor Jim Scudamore, but the other representatives on his expert group who actually came back with the recommendation, this is how you need to now respond to the matter. And we've taken that on board uh, to bring forward this piece of uh, legislation. So we've arrived here with very good reason. Uh, and I think it is, uh, it's incumbent on us to make sure uh, that we take this forward in a, in a way which is appropriate and will make sure that we get the right type of provision around food safety in Scotland uh, as we uh, require. I think um, Duncan McNeill also made, I think, a number of very important points about where uh, the FSS needs to sit in with the rest of the regulatory bodies and functions which are already out there. So it's partnership uh, with the FSA and the rest of uh, the UK, with other representative organisations in the rest of uh, Europe and beyond uh, are absolutely critical. Uh, and alongside that, they also are uh, local authorities or health boards and the uh, uh, producers, retailers, the role that they all have 
uh, in, our, uh, in, in food safety and in food production in Scotland. Uh, the FSS has an important role to play uh, and that we will need to make sure that it fulfils that role effectively uh, and in an appropriate way as well. I hope members are reassured by the uh, memorandum of understanding which we are taking forward with the rest of the UK Government around uh, a range of different issues which I believe will be a very productive way for us to continue what I think is already uh, from the process we've been going through to establish Food Standards Scotland uh, has been a very cordial and a very uh, responsive uh, 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 way in which uh, we've engaged with one another in taking this whole area of policy forward. I want to turn to a point which I thought a very important point that was raised by Richard Simpson uh, and a number of members have raised it and that was around the whole issue about dietary improvement and how uh, the FSS can assist in coordinating uh, this whole approach to tackling uh, uh, dietary issues and also improving nutrition and we've put it on the bill to give it that very clear strategic role uh, that no other body in the country presently has in order to help to drive this agenda forward. And I think Richard Simpson made a very good point about uh, needing to tackle issues around uh, salt, sugar and fat uh, in our diet. And the FSA have taken forward a range of work over a number of years now where they have made progress. So, for example, it would be fair to say that a lot of our big retailers, supermarket retailers, including Asda and Tesco, uh, have, uh, would you call it, have uh, have, uh, have adjusted, reformulated their own branded products to reduce uh, things like salt and fat uh, and sugar within their products. The area where we have made less progress has been actually in the branded pro uh, products. And I think we're getting to the point where we have to make sure that retailers recognise that they are part of the solution in dealing with their nutritional challenges and the dietary problems we have in Scotland and in tackling obesity. It is a societal issue. Uh, and our retailers and our food producers have to play their part in helping to overcome this issue. And I believe that the FSS have got an important role to help us in making sure that happens effectively here in Scotland. I also want to turn to a point Richard Simpson and several others uh, raised, and that was about the wider potential remit of the FSS. Um, I was very clear uh, at the time when we decided to take forward this uh, piece of legislation that I wanted to protect the reputational integrity that we have here in Scotland for good food products. I wanted to make sure that we protected the very the first class work that is presently taken forward by our FSA here in Scotland to make sure that there is no loss of public confidence as we move to a new public body. That is why we have taken an approach which is a cautious approach, and that is to make sure we get the things that the FSA does just now right in the new body, so that there is no question about its role and people having confidence in it. But we have created a footprint in the legislation which allows us to expand it and develop it as we move forward. And rightly so, if we do that, we then have to look at the resource implications that some members have made uh, reference to. Now, Nanette Millen, in her contribution, made reference to uh, obesity and nutrition as well, uh, and she touched on this issue of funding. I think it's important to recognise is that we already fund the Scottish proportion of FSA's activity. So we fund it at a Scottish level and we also pay a central amount to the UK body for some of the centralised roles which they undertake. So the budget for the FSA that goes to Scotland just now is the budget that is already part of the Scottish Government's health budget, which will go to the FSS. The issue that we are still in negotiation with is around some of those centralised functions that we already pay for and actually moving them into the Scottish organisation. And I'm confident we'll get to an agreement on that. But I want to give members an assurance that the FSS will have the budgets required in order to undertake the functions that are presently undertaken by the FSA. And if we move forward and choose to change that, then of course the government at that time, whichever government the day that may be, will have to consider as to what those resource implications uh, may be. Now, uh, Aileen McLeod and her contribution uh, highlighted the whole issue of research and the importance of research within uh, the food and animal health uh, sector. I think, as a number of members have uh, rightly pointed out, it is important that the FSS are able to participate in research programmes at a UK level, but it is also important that we have access to that expert advice as we intend and we have agreed with the FSA, but equally that we also provide access to the expert advice that comes from Scotland. As has already been highlighted by Lewis MacDonald in his own contribution, the expert advice that we have here in Scotland around uh, issues around uh, nutrition and dietary issues, the expert advice that we provide around shellfish in particular and in E. coli. 
These are areas where, the, where Scotland already provides that level of expert advice, and it is our intention for that to continue uh, to take place, but equally for us also to be able to participate in research programmes on a European level where there is a range of work uh, that we can contribute to as well. Can I turn to the issue that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Claire Baker uh, raised as well around the issue of the employee director, which I think is a very good and a very uh, fair point and one which we are very sympathetic to uh, on the basis that our own track record around our health bodies at the present time have an employee director appointed to uh, the board uh, by ministers. This is an issue which we will have to... The reason we can't make a decision on it just now is because we don't have a chief executive and a chair and a board in place. But what I want to reassure the member is that, given our track record on our present health-led bodies, is that this is an area where I would like to see that also being reflected in the FSS and going forward, because I think it's a very valuable role uh, that the employee director can have in a national organisation. The point that you also raised around EROs or, uh, or environmental uh, uh, health officers as well, I think I, I should say uh, EHOs, not EROs. That's what happens when you get caught up in elections. But uh, would you call, uh, I think uh, is a, and also a very valid point. One of the things that I do think is that the administrative uh, fixed penalty regime will help to relieve some of the burden that is faced by some of our EHOs because very often when they want to take issues forward, it's a report to the procurator fiscal. There are reports that then have to be then further submitted and then I'll wait for it to go to court, which sometimes can actually take more than a year or two before it even finds itself in the court. And a fixed penalty scheme gives us a way in which we can actually release some of that burden, which is why some of our EHOs in Scotland have very much welcomed that, because it allows them to be much more responsive and it allows them to then move on to other uh, issues. But one of the other things we have to look about is the testing that's undertaken by our EHOs. And there are different models that we can use with the, FSA, the FSS in taking that forward. Do we have it more centrally controlled by the FSS, working with local authorities and funding local authorities for the purpose of undertaking that testing? But we also need to make sure we have a, a, a good collection of that data at a national level. So I think in moving forward, there are a variety of different options that we can look at pursuing which can help to address some of those issues um, as well. And can I say as well on the issue about uh, what you call, um, the fixed penalties, which a, no a number of members have raised around uh, an appeals mechanism. I do think we have to be careful that we don't get into a situation where uh, there is an ex expectation that every and any uh, uh, fixed penalty notice can be appealed on the basis that it could potentially just draw the whole system to a halt by repeated appeals. If you consider at the present time, if you are stopped by the police and you're offered a fixed penalty notice for a driving offence, you do have the right to refuse that. And if you choose to refuse it, a report goes to the procurator fiscal and then eventually the matter will go into court and you can then argue your case there. There is an element within this process that if you are issued with a fixed penalty, you disagree with the EHO in offering that fixed penalty, you have the choice then to refuse it and for the matter then to go to the procurator fiscal and for you to challenge it in court as well. I do think we need to have a transparency and we need to make sure there's a, a consistency of approach in how these measures are applied from local authority to local authority. But I do think, and I would strike a note of caution in calling for an overall uh, what you call, uh, uh, process of appeal. General Officer, I've unfortunately not been able to go through all of the members who have made a whole range of very valuable points which we'll consider as we move forward with this legislation. But I want to finish on this point, and that is that our staff in the FSA in Aberdeen do an absolutely fantastic job for us. And I'm very proud of the job that they have done over a number of years for, this, for us. This has also been a, a difficult time for them in the uncertainty of moving to a new body. And I'm sure that all members will want to send out a clear note from this Parliament that we value the work that they undertake. And as we move towards the Food Standards, uh, food standards Scotland, we will make sure that these staff are allowed to continue to undertake that valuable work here in Scotland. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate on stage one of the Food Scotland Bill. The next item of business is consideration of motion number 10555 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution for the Food Scotland Bill. I call Michael Matheson to move the motion. Moved. Question. This motion will be put decision time to which we now come. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is at motion number 11048 in the name of Michael Matheson on the Food Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 10555 in the name of John Swinney and the financial resolution for the Food Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time and I now close this meeting.